Yes, Ms. Orr. Yeah. Uh, the Commission, please, as the next witness is Ms. Linda Harris. Come into the witness box, please, Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, would you prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to be affirmed? Uh, affirmed, please. Yes, affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely declare and confirm affirm, affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you very much Ms Harris do sit down yes Ms Hogan Laura Ms Harris could you please state your full name for the commissioner Linda Gay Harris and your business address 225 George Street Sydney and what position do you hold um, General Manager, People and Culture. For which company? For AHL Investments, Rattery Limited, okay. known as Aussie. Okay. Uh, do you have a copy of your summons? I do. And do you, you made a statement on the 7th of March, 2018? Yes. yes. Do you have a copy of that with you? I do. And do you have a copy of exhibits with you to that yes, statement? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. Are there any corrections that you wish to make to that statement? Um, there is one correction. And what, where is that? Um, that's paragraph 187. That's on page 24 of your statement. Paragraph 187. Yes, that's right. So um, instead of it talking about a franchisee's eligibility, it actually should be a retail business consultant's eligibility. Right. For the benefit so what words do you want to change in there? Um, so the word franchisee, which is on the second line, yes. third word in, that needs to be changed to retail business consultant. Yes, thank you. Ms Would Harris, would you... Be good enough to make the amendment and the initial... Thank you, I've done that. That correction now having been made, is that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. Thank you. Uh, do you produce the summons, Ms Harris, that brought you here? I do, yes. Yes, that'll be Exhibit 1.40, the summons to Ms Harris. Exhibit 1.41 will be the uh, statement of Ms Harris dated 7 March 18 and the exhibits to it. Question, please. Yes. Ms. Orr. Ms. Harris, you've been put forward by Aussie Home Loans to give evidence to this commission about misconduct by four former brokers at Aussie Home Loans. I have. Uh, and you, you said that your employer was AHL Investments, is that right? That's right, And yes. what's the relationship between AHL Investments and <coughs> Aussie Home Loans? Aussie Home Loans is part of AHL Investments. Uh, Aussie, Aussie Home Loans has two types of mortgage brokers, is that right? That's right, yes. And uh, what the first type is the Aussie retail brokers? Yes, so we have brokers who either operate a store as a franchisee or work for the franchisee in a store, and the definition of those is retail. Yes, I see. And the other category is Aussie mobile brokers, is That's that right? That's right, yes. And can you explain the difference between those two? So the mobile brokers tend to be single operators in their own business um, and they will not have, normally have premises in which the customer can come so they will go and see the customer. Um, whether that's their home or their office or somewhere else, that's up to the customer. In the early part of the statement that you've provided to the Commission, you mentioned first line and second line risk management at Aussie Home Loans. Yes. Can you describe what those are? Sure. So first line risk management are roles that are directly interacting with the brokers. So they would be, for instance, the mobile business leaders, the retail business consultants, um, people on in the state office or working directly with the brokers. Level two is the risk and compliance team. So they are centralised and they will be scanning files without that direct interaction unless there's an issue, in which case they will come and consult and guide. And you are part of the second line risk management, is that right? I'm not directly 
part of that. So the client's team sit under someone else. Um, so my role is to be aware of what is happening with the business, um, but not necessarily direct those functions. So you're not part of the first line or the second line risk and compliance functions? No, not directly. Right. In your statement, you refer to the accreditation of brokers. Yes. Uh, what's the difference between the accreditation required by Aussie Home Loans and the accreditation required by a lender? Um, I can't tell you exactly what lenders do, but I can certainly talk to you about our process. So there is a, a rigorous recruitment process involving reference checking. Um, there is a police and credit check that's conducted. Um, there is a, um, an attestation that in the process of that the candidate is asked to complete, um, which says that they haven't had any convictions and they haven't been banned from operating within our industry. Um, they, need to be, uh, they need to be able to be a member of the MFAA and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman. So that's the process that they need to go through. Um, in addition, there is a four-week induction program and importantly, someone will need to success, both successfully complete that four-week induction program and therefore qualify for a certificate for in financial services. Um, or and, and they need to be able to demonstrate during that period the kind of behaviour and interpersonal skills and relationship skills which are necessary for them to represent our brand. So, you know, we look for integrity, honesty, someone that's able to show good judgement during the course of that. And that's simply an additional factor. So a number of the other factors are, are also considered in that. To be an accredited broker for Aussie Home Loans, uh, does a person also need to be accredited by lenders? Yes, they do. Sorry, I should have said that. So with every lender on our panel? Yes. And you mentioned membership of uh, the MFAA. That's one of two uh, industry associations for mortgage brokers, is that right? It is, that's right, yes. And why has Aussie chosen that one rather than the other one, which is the FBAA. Yes, um, and it was quite a few years ago now, but, um, and at the time, the MFAA was the only association which expelled brokers. Um, so there was a level of frustration in Aussie that we would terminate a broker for doing the wrong thing and they would go and work for someone else. So um, we actually applied to the ACCC for us to be able to dictate that all of our brokers need to be a member of the MFAA as opposed to the MFAA or the FBAA. We, we believed it was a more rigorous organisation. You set out in your statement the things that brokers have to do to maintain their accreditation as That's well. Right. And one yes. of those things is maintaining their accreditation with the panel lenders. That's right. Uh, but accreditation by panel lenders isn't a legal requirement. That's an internal Aussie Home Loans requirement. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So it, it's about the proposition for the customer. So we advertise a proposition. That proposition um, covers finding the loan that is not unsuitable from the full span of Especially loans. At the moment, I think uh, we might see what Joy is producing feedback. At least we haven't got the taxi uh, system cutting in on us yet. That which was lost is found. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry. Uh, we might have to go back. Uh, uh, question was, but accreditation by panel lenders isn't a legal requirement, but that's an internal Aussie home loans requirement. Is that right? You began your answer. Yes, that's right. So it's about the proposition for the customer. So we advertise a proposition. That proposition covers finding the loan that is not unsuitable from the, spool, from the full span of loans. That's when I cut you off. Uh, do you want to go on from there? <laughs> Um, I don't want to go on much more than that, but it, it is just about, about making sure that we are able to look across the board. Do Aussie brokers tell customers 
that they can only apply, that the customer can only apply for a loan with a lender on Aussie's panel? The, an Aussie broker will tell the customer that they can only provide them with a loan on our panel. Um, our panel certainly provides loans to cover sort of 90, 95% of home loans provided in the marketplace, but we don't have everyone on the panel, no. And each Aussie uh, retail broker and mobile broker is an authorised credit representative of Aussie, is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, you would understand that in respect of its authorised representative brokers, Aussie has various obligations? Yes which include ensuring that it has adequate systems and procedures in place to monitor and supervise the brokers. Yes. Uh, and ensuring that the brokers are adequate, adequately trained and competent to engage in Aussie's credit activities. That's right. Uh, and these are requirements both under Aussie's credit licence yes. and under the National Credit Act. Is that right? That's right. Now, um, could I just uh, have brought up on the screen a particular legislative provision, which is section 47 of the National Credit Act. Are you familiar with that provision, Ms Harris? I'm not familiar with the detail, but yes. I understand overall what our responsibilities are. It's RCD 00220001. I see. Uh, I'm looking for section 47 in that document. Uh, I thought I had the reference for it, but it seems not. I'm not sure if section 47 can be found within... It's not the whole act there, as I understand it, so it shouldn't be too hard to find, but... Uh, uh, it, it's a legislative provision that I want to ask you some questions about, Ms Harris, that imposes obligations on uh, credit providers and credit assistance providers, in, including Aussie Home Loans. And, and they include, as the first obligation, an obligation to ensure that the credit activities that are authorised by the licence are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Are you familiar yes. with that obligation? I am. And are you familiar with the obligation imposed by Section 47 uh, to have adequate risk management systems? I am, yes. Uh, and the obligation imposed by Section 47 to take reasonable steps to ensure that Aussie's representatives comply with the credit legislation? Yes. Uh, and Aussie has to have available adequate resources to engage in the credit activities authorised by its licence and to carry out supervisory arrangements. Are you familiar with that obligation? Yes, I am. Now, have you uh, ever seen the ASIC regulatory guide that provides some assistance to people such as Aussie about uh, how to discharge those obligations? I haven't looked at it in detail, no. Yes, we have now section 47 yes. on the screen. I've taken you through aspects of that provision already and I think your evidence is that you're familiar with those obligations as they're imposed on Aussie home loans. Yes. Uh, and the ASIC regulatory guidance tells us that uh, uh, entities such as Aussie have to have measures or compliance measures uh, to refer to processes, procedures or arrangements for ensuring that they comply with these obligations. Yes. Are you familiar with I'm familiar with that, with that obligation, yes. Okay. Now, uh, can I turn from talking to you about those obligations that are imposed on Aussie to talking to you about the conduct of the four brokers that your witness statement deals with. Yes. Conduct that I think we can, I can ask you at the outset, conduct that you would agree um, was not consistent with these conduct obligations imposed on Aussie home loans by this statutory regime. I would agree. Yes. Yes. So could we start with the first of those brokers whose name was Mr Shiv Sahay? Yes. Uh, and Aussie first became aware of misconduct by him on the 8th of August 2013, you tell us in your statement. That's right, yes. 
And do you recall how Aussie became aware of misconduct by Mr Sahay? Uh, I do. So Suncorp as a lender came to us with concerns about his loan. So Suncorp uh, contacted Aussie yep. and told Aussie that it had made a decision to terminate Mr Sahay from its accreditation process. Is That's that right? right? That's right. And I'll show you a document which is AHL triple zero two triple zero one two four two one this is an email chain and could I ask that we bring up the second and third pages of the email chain which are the first in time we see there the email notification to Aussie from Suncorp on the 8th of August 2013. Uh, so Mr Sahay is identified. Uh, Suncorp tells Aussie that an initial concern has been raised uh, via one of our branches by particular clients. Uh, the customer told me that the loan was set up as an investment loan and the broker used rental income to increase the income. The borrowers advised me they are living in the property and said the broker just did it that way so they would get the loan. And as a consequence of being told that by those customers, Suncorp tells you that they've conducted a review of applications from that broker and that they've worked out they have concerns with seven other files that that broker was involved in. That's right. And on the basis of that, uh, Suncorp tells you that their inclination is to terminate the broker's accreditation, but they'll hold off until you have an opportunity to review, and they ask you to revert with the outcome of that review at the earliest possible opportunity. Yes. And the response from Aussie, if we can pull up the first and second pages next to each other, Same day, appreciate the call and heads up, Aussie takes these matters very seriously. We are grateful that you have allowed us time to conduct our internal review or audit before commencing your preferred course of action. We'll keep you in the loop with the progress of our investigation, the outcomes and resulting course of action. We need to discuss John's email as a matter of urgency. So this all happens on the 8th of August. Uh, and <coughs> First thing I want to put to you is that therefore we see from these documents that this misconduct, which we'll come to in more detail, was not detected by Aussie. Aussie found out about it when a lender reported um, concerns of a particular customer. Yes, I agree with that. Yes, so Aussie's systems neither prevented the misconduct from occurring or detected the misconduct. In this particular instance, yes, you're yes. right. Yes. And so the following day, the 9th of August 2013, Aussie conducted a review of the loan files for Mr Sahay, is that right? That's right, yes. And later that day, Aussie terminated its contract with Mr Sahay's company. That's right. Is that right. correct? And that night, Aussie sent emails to various Aussie panel lenders advising that it had terminated its contract with Mr Sahay's company. That's right. Now, could I show you one of those letters? Uh, it's an email, so AHL 0002 0001 uh, We have, we've blacked out entirely, it seems, who the email's gone to, but you've seen these emails Ms Harrison, you know that these are emails that went to various lenders. To the best of my knowledge, they would have yes. gone to various lenders, yes. And the lender is told no more than Aussie recently <coughs> terminated its contract with Shiv Sahay's company. In accordance with our obligations, we request that you review all loan applications that are pending settlement and settled loans that were submitted by Shiv Sahay and take all necessary action to carefully manage the loan applications and settled loans. Yes. Uh, now, in your statement, you explained that uh, a communication like this went out to, in your words, various lenders. Did these letters go out to all of the lenders on the panel that had accredited Mr Sahay? The process was for a letter to go out to every member on the panel. 
And the letter says nothing to the lender about why Mr Sahay's been terminated by Aussie? The letter doesn't, but there is, there is an arrangement with the lenders so that if we do not say no adverse circumstances, then they will understand that there's a reason why the person has been terminated. Um, secondly, the fact that we tell them, alert them to the fact that they should be reviewing loans written by that person is further, is further evidence to them that there is a problem. Well, why doesn't Aussie tell the lender what the problem is, what the nature of the problem is? I can't answer that at the time, and this was back in 2013. I believe it was a legal advice to not specifically say, um, and I can't give you the rationale because I'm not a lawyer, but um, it was certainly the case then. And I think it was around, if we were to say fraud, you know, that, that some people have a different definition of what we would term fraud. I think it was around that, but that's, I can't categorically tell you. So what, what's the lender meant to look for in their review? How do they know what to look for? The lender would immediately look for any issues in the loan application and if the loan application on the surface looked um, okay, then they would always look at the supporting documents. And in the case of Mr Sahay, it was the supporting documents in particular where um, there were concerns. So your evidence is that there was an arrangement whereby there was, in essence, some sort of code between Aussie and the lenders, uh, whereby if the words no adverse circumstances were not used in the communication, the lender was to understand that there was some form of adverse circumstances that you would not provide any information of. So in those situations, um, that wouldn't have been in the letter, but it is very um, we are very, very willing to help. And so what you would normally find is that the lenders would be contacting someone like Mr McKenzie um, and asking him for more details about why this happened so that they were more targeted in their search. Well, I, I want to put to you that it's not in Aussie's interest to tell the lenders what has happened uh, because Aussie's trail commission might be terminated by the lenders if if Aussie tells the lender that loans have been fraudulently obtained? Um, that is actually not the case. So Aussie communicates with the lenders. Um, we know that if there are any loans that are deemed to be fraudulent in any way, then the Trail Commission will stop on those, that, that the lender has the right to cease payment of that. Um, that's acknowledged by us. Well, I'll show you some documents as we go, but I want to suggest to you that Aussie works very hard to get to an end point where the lender does not cease the trial commissions in these circumstances. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that, but okay. perhaps you can show me something yes, that well will change work, my mind. Yes, let's work through the documents. Yep. This review that was conducted by Aussie that led to the termination of Mr Sahay was conducted over the course of a single day. That's right. The notification from Suncourt comes on the 8th of August. The review is on the 9th of August and by 6pm, 6 6.16 that night, the letters are going out to the lenders. Um, that's right in this case. They normally take longer than that, but in this case it was an efficient process and that's primarily driven by the fact that Suncorp came to us and said they were going to. They didn't come to us and say, we've got some concerns about these files, can you please review? They came and said, we are seriously considering termination. So the process then was far more urgent, far more sp speedy, because we needed to ensure that we also supported the concept um, that the broker had had um, conducted it himself in a way that was completely and utterly unacceptable. Yes, well, I'll, I'll put to you that the review must have revealed very, very quickly that there were grave issues uh, with the loans that were being submitted by Mr Sahay. The review very quickly showed that the supporting documentation was fraudulent, yes. Yes, and that had not been picked up by no. Aussie. How long had Mr Sahay been an Aussie broker at this time? Um, he'd been an Aussie broker for about uh, 20, 18, 20 months, I believe. Yes. So the review that Aussie does takes a day and then Aussie asks the lenders by this communication to conduct their own review. Yes. 
So rather than conducting a thorough review at Aussie's end, Aussie relies on the lenders to do that. Is that right? So after the, they also, we also ask them to look both at any current loans mm -hmm. and also settled loans, which we don't necessarily have access to after settlement. Yes, so, so. It's, it's restricted. The review that you're suggesting they undertake is restricted to pending settlement and settled loans. And settled loans. And settled loans. Yes. But how is the lender going to do that? They don't have access to the broker's computer, the broker's files or emails, all of that sits with you at Aussie, doesn't it? Um, it does. Once the application, though, is submitted on behalf of the customer, then the application goes through a system called Apply Online and actually is with the lenders. So the lender would have had access, in this case Suncorp, would have had access to those loans. Now, I, I just want to go back to something that you said earlier, Ms Harris. You said that uh, Mr Sahay had been with Aussie for 20 months. Could I ask that you be shown a document, ASIC.0011006-0017, mm -hmm. Sorry, um, in my statement it says 14th of November 2011 to 6th of August 2013, so. What paragraph are you reading from there, Ms Harris? Um, I'm reading, I'm reading the first, that's the first question. So broker misconduct events, Shiv Sahay. How and when Aussie first became aware of the fraudulent conduct, including falsification of home loan documents between 14th of November and 6th of August. Sorry, then I misread that. I can't tell you how long he'd been with us for. My apologies. Well, the, the document I'm taking you to is um, the Aussie contract with Mr Sahay's company. And if we turn within that document to 0039, Yes, so that Can you suggests hear me? it had been about four years that yes, he'd been my a apologies. broker with you, yes. not 20 months. Yes, my apologies. That's right. Okay. Um, there was, after these letters were sent out to the lenders, uh, an incident report, an incident report created by Aussie about Mr Sahay, is that right? Yes, that went to the ERC, yes. Right. Went to? The Executive Risk Committee. And that document, I think, is AHL 0002 Is that right, Ms Harris? Is that the incident report that was prepared? Um, yes, it was. Yes. Could, I, could we have the first and second page displayed on the screen, please? We'll see that this report is dated the 3rd of September 2013. Yes. And the risk incident details record that the initial contact was from Suncorp and there'd been further investigation from Suncorp and then a formal notification of termination of the lender's accreditation on the 9th of August. Yes. Aussie's agreement with the broker was terminated on 9 August following a high level review undertaken by risk and sales operations. Do you then see the section headed controls that did not work or were not in place? Yes, I do. This issue is difficult to identify purely from the documents retained by Aussie. Random reviews of loan files for this broker have been undertaken and have not identified any irregularities of a similar nature. From 1 July 2012, nine files have been reviewed for this broker with three fails and six passes. The last five files reviewed passed. Now, the last five were fine, but there had been three fails in file reviews prior to that time. What happened as a result of those three fa fails on the file reviews? So fail doesn't necessarily doesn't mean fraudulent. Fail means that they that the broker had not completed all responsibilities under responsible lending. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so the, in those cases when someone, when there's a 
review of a file and the person hasn't passed, so in the categories now it's considered a C or a D, um, then immediately that information is passed back to the mobile business leader in this case, because he was part of the mobile channel. Um, and the mobile business leader needs to sit down with the broker and go through what the concerns are. So they're given a report by the compliance team and they sit and go through the concerns. Do you see the impact section below that, Ms Harris? three types of impact. The first is financial. There's a positive financial impact because no trail is payable, which must mean, it seems to me, no trail is payable by Aussie to Mr Sahay on a loan book of approximately $70 million. That's what it says, yes. Yes. So that means Aussie is going to continue to benefit uh, from Mr Sahay's loan book after his termination. So the logic that we that for that is we will continue to look after the customer. So if he's terminated, we will continue to have the processes and systems in order to ensure that the customer's ongoing needs post settlement are looked after. And you will keep taking the trial commissions for that. We keep taking the trial commission for that. Yes. But there's also for looking after the customer. Yeah. There's also a negative financial impact because there's a loss of a broker who was settling approximately thirty million dollars of loans per year. Yes. Reputation minimal impact with SunCorp expressing appreciation on the rapid response to the issue raised. Now that reflects the fact that within twenty four hours after being notified of their position on this. Aussie terminated. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And regulatory, the assessment is that the prompt action taken should minimise any regulatory impact. Yes, um, on the basis that we acted promptly to take the broker out of the business. Mm -hmm. And then over the page... Sorry, just before you depart from that yep. section, uh, you spoke of Aussie uh, continuing to earn its trail commission. Uh, for looking after the customer's needs after settlement. What would those needs be? Um, they vary from a customer wanting to change perhaps from um, a fixed rate, sorry, a variable to a fixed, so depending on what was happening with the interest rates. A customer might want to do a variation, um, so they want to renovate the house and they'll do a variation to the loan. Those kind of things, as if the customer's made a, needs If the change. customer made a new transaction, that would be a new event for a new commission, wouldn't it? If that's what the best outcome for the customer was, but that w that's certainly not the goal. The goal is to look after whatever the customer is wanting. I, I, I'm not grasping, I think, sufficiently what kinds of need a customer has after settlement for the remaining, if it's a 30-year loan, 29 years, uh, that uh, the Trail Commission will continue to accrue? In theory. Yeah. Um, if a customer is not being looked after and things happen in the marketplace, that will trigger them to ask questions. So. You know, what we'd like is that they contact, contact their broker if they are asking questions and the broker contacts the customer on a regular basis just to check whether there are any of those questions. Um, sometimes customers aren't thinking of their interest rate um, and if there's changes with the RBA and changes happen, um, then there is reason to trigger the customer into saying, are you still happy with what, with the loan that you're on? It is simply a question to ask the, ask the customer. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Orr. Do you see number four, Ms. Harris, remediation and action plans? And A is remedial action description. This is to address the impact, including estimated completion dates and action owner. And what we see in response to that is, broker has had his agreement with Aussie cancelled. Um, that, that's the entirety of the remedial action taken by Aussie? Um, that, that's according to that form, yes. 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 And I'll, I'll show you some documents, but I'm going to put to you that Aussie didn't contact <coughs> any of Mr Sahay's customers to advise them 
of what had been detected in relation to Mr Sahay's conduct. You're saying we didn't contact any of his pending customers? The any of his um, pending or former customers? Um, I've read correspondence with pending customers who were raising... Correspondence from Aussie or from the No, lender? from customers and, and phone calls to the mobile business leader um, and the mobile business leader feeding that into us with questions about... You'll have to direct me to those documents. And I don't... I, they were documents. I don't have them here, but I can certainly provide those documents. And you haven't referred to that in your statement, have you? No, I haven't, no. The only contact with Mr Sahay's customers occurs when two of Mr Sahay's customers contact Aussie. Is that right? Two of them contacted Aussie. Yes, yes they did. And, and I'll take you to each of those instances, but yes. I want to put to you that other than those two instances initiated by the customer, there were no discussions between Aussie and Mr Sahay's customers about the fraud that had been detected and whether it might impact on any of them. Um, I, I know that we reallocated every customer that was pending to another broker so that the, broker, the next broker could help them through. Yes. I know that we had a mobile business leader who was managing the process and who was liaising with the customers um, about the process. Um, I can't tell you whether they specifically said that Mr Sahay had committed fraud. Mm. They would have said that Mr Sahay had left and we wanted to look after them and someone else would be given to them as their broker. And, and why weren't they told that Mr Sahay had committed <coughs> fraud? I don't know. And my personal opinion, um, we should be open about that. And you're not, are you? It's still the case today that when these sorts of things happen, Aussie does not contact customers to inform them that the broker who they dealt with um, has been found to have engaged in fraud. I, what I can't guarantee to you um, is what verbal conversations are being had. I can't guarantee, certainly in writing, you're right, the letters to the lenders, that's clearly been evidenced. Um, I don't know what verbal conversations are being had. Mm, and I'm not talking about with the lenders now, I'm talking with the with customers. With the customers, yes, no, I understand the with the customers. The customers aren't told, are they, Ms Harris? I can't tell you one way or the other, I'm sorry. I would like to, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in this instance with Mr Sahay, uh, on the 17th of September, there was a communication from one of Mr Sahay's customers to Aussie, wasn't there? There was, yes. yes. Now, could I show you a document which is... Uh, uh, I think it's AHL 000214786. Now, do you see here this is um, an email, an internal email between two members of Aussie? Uh, and perhaps if we can have the second page on the screen, it will assist. Melanie Tompkins is asking uh, Melissa Good uh, to put in an email the conversation she had with Shiv's previous client and what she said happened when she was contacted by the bank. Then we see the email in response from Melissa Good explaining what her customer with her contact with the customer um, uh, was. She says to uh, Melanie Tompkins, she contacted me at 11.30 a.m. on the 18th of September, advising that CBA had contacted her and wanted to discuss a statement that was used to support her home loan with Bank West. The person told her that it was, that it was if she was found to have known about this incorrect statement that she could be charged with serious offences. She was confused about what they were relating to and she wanted to go into the bank today to see what they were referring to. She was under the impression that they had made some sort of mistake as she had given a CBA statement with an amount of 25,000 and didn't understand what the 39,000 was that they referred to. She was extremely stressed about the person making threats about being charged and possibly jailed. She asked what paperwork I had. 
When I accessed the file I had, I contacted her to confirm the figures I had on the statement copy and she advised that it was correct and that was the statement she had given to Shiv. She then said that the bank must have it wrong because the statement I have is correct. It was left that she was going to try to go into a CBA branch today. She has not contacted me again today. I know it isn't the best timing with what has happened, but will this affect the commissions paid on the file? As Simon advised, it was transferred to me and would take effect post-settlement. So this records a communication uh, from a customer who has been contacted by CBA, contacted by CBA because Bank West was one of the lenders involved who was looking into Mr Sahay's conduct. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and she's calling Aussie, distressed about that contact. Yes. Wanting to know why this discrepancy exists between the $25,000 on her statement and $39,000 that's on the CBA paperwork. Um, now, the response of this particular individual uh, at Aussie was, uh, at least in part, uh, to find out whether this contact affected the commission, the trailing commission that they were going to be taking over from Mr Sahay on the loan. Do you agree? Uh, that's what that states, yes. Yes. Now, I'll, I'll tender that document, Commissioner. We've had a number of other documents referred I did. Could, to. I, I, I've missed a number. I could do them all now if that is convenient. Well, if we go sure. back to AHL 0002 0001 2421, email Mackenzie to McDonald, 8 August 2013, that would be Exhibit 1.42. Uh, AHL 0002 0001 2463, email from Mackenzie, 9 August 2013, that would be. Uh, exhibit 1.43. Uh, then I think it's the current one, is it? Or is there an intermediate one? I'm sorry, Commissioner, I have a list of five. I've not been paying strict attention, have I? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying I'm attention. About to be you were doing much down. better than me. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, could I just read the doc IDs for my five? 0002 0001 2421, 0003 0001 2463. Those two are respectively exhibits 1.42 and 1.43. Then ASIC 0010060017. Exhibit 1.44, what do I describe it as? Uh, that was the extract from the uh, NCCPA, Commissioner, section 47. I'm not sure that I need to tender that. If you'd like me to, I can. I can think of nothing I would like more, Ms. <laughs> or than that you not tender the National Thank you. Credit Act. Well, but uh, I think that, that that actual code was the contract with Mr. Uh, I think the ASIC was the... Yes, the, oh, thank you. The, Thank you. It had uh, to come to this, Ms Orr, that we'd get I'm tangled sorry. in our documents. I'm We've very survived sorry, thus far. My fault. So that doc ID that I just gave you, I do wish to tender. That was Mr Sahay's loan contract with Aussie Home Loans. So exhibit 1.44, ASIC 0011, 006, 0017 is contract of Sahay. Yes. I'm, I'm corrected. I, I said loan contract. It's not a loan contract, no. Commissioner. Then AHL 0002 0001 Which is which? Oh, we're all at sea. That's now, the incident report. That was the incident report. Thank you very much to my learned friend. Glad someone's paying attention. I'm obviously not sufficiently. <laughs> Exhibit 1.45, AHL treble uh, 02 treble 01 2409, incident report. And the final document, which was the email from Melissa Good to Melanie Tompkins. 19 September tw uh, 2013, AHL treble 02 treble 01 4786, 
will be exhibit 1.46. I think Thank the ledger is squared. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, now, that communication from the customer uh, on the 18th of September that's reflected in the email I just took you to. Yes. Uh, there is another uh, exchange of emails internally about this customer communication, which I'll take you to. This email chain starts at AHL 0000000014701. And could I take you to the first email in the chain, which is on 4706? Again, an email between Melissa Good and Melanie Tompkins. <coughs> this is an email that relates to the same customer contact. Hi Mel, as per my voice message tonight, please find attached requested documents. I have confirmed with the customer that the statement that I have a copy of is the one she provided to Shiv. You will note that the CBA statement shows a balance of 25,000, but on the funds to complete, and Shiv's comments, it notes that there is an amount of 40,000. CBA have told the customer that the statement showed an amount of 39,000. The customer is under the impression that CBA have made a mistake with their figures or statement and is going in tomorrow to try to get copies and discuss. I am not sure what to advise the customer as she thinks CBA have made an error. Not sure if you want to give her a call tomorrow before she goes into the branch to find out what has been done. Now, why didn't Melissa Good tell this customer who called in distress in fear of imprisonment what had occurred? That Mr Sahay had uh, engaged in fraud by changing the figures from the $25,000 on the statement to the $39,000 when she well knew that that was what had occurred. I can't tell you why it wasn't done. It was obviously the process back then. I think that I don't agree with that process and I think there needs to be open communication with customers. But there, um, was, there was not open communication with this customer, in, was there, Ms In Harris? this particular case, mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there are in this email chain that I'll tender some further discussions internally about how to deal with this, but they relate to communicating with Bank West about why Bank West has gone to the customer first about this rather than gone to Aussie Home Loans. Um, have you seen this email chain before? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll tender that email chain, Commissioner, which is AHL 0002-0001-4701. Uh, email to Mackenzie and accompanying emails will be Exhibit 1.47. Now, before we move on to um, further conduct by Aussie in relation to this event, uh, there is a document uh, that we have that shows what Bank West was doing in relation to this event, and I'll, I'll take you to that. Um, AHL 0002-0001-4780. Now, this is an email from the 17th of September from a person at Bank West to a person at Aussie. We've found some possible problems on this broker's deals. There is a strong likelihood of falsified bank statements, although we're continuing our review. Now, this, of course, is the day prior to the contact from the customer on the 18th of September 2013. And if we turn to the next page, we'll see a document that was annexed to that email. This is 5070. 
0000015070. Thank you. So this is uh, a document recording um, some investigative work done by Bank West once it became aware uh, of these issues. There was an audit conducted by Bank West that revealed 10 alleged fraudulent mortgage applications. Under the heading audit information, audit was conducted from data produced on a report by CBA Fraud Analytics from deals submitted in the last six months. And it's CBA because Bank West is um, affiliated with CBA. There were 16 deals submitted during this period. An audit conducted on the first two deals revealed falsified OFI bank statements with inflated savings. Now, precisely what the customer um, contacted Aussie about. Employment details for these applications were correct. It was decided the audit would continue with all applications during this period, which had provided OFI. OFI is other financial institution, is that right? who had provided OFI bank statements and or in the current pipeline. So the audit statistics are deals fully audited 11, fraud located 10, <coughs> only one assessed to be okay to proceed. And Mr Sahay had submitted 131 loans to Bank West. Uh, and we see, yes, on the following page, that this report that was provided to Aussie gives a summary of the 10 identified fraudulent loans. So this was provided to Aussie on the 17th of September. Is that correct? Um, I believe so. Yes. yes, as I said, on the day prior to the communication from the customer who was also contacted by CBA. I tender that document, Commissioner. That's exhibit 1.48. AHL 0010015070, Bankwest Broker Investigation, 17 September 2013. There's two separate documents, I'm told, there, so I will need to tender both, Commissioner. Uh, four the seven, email as well. Yes, 4780 is the email, and yes. 5070 is the Broker Investigation Report. Exhibit 1.49, AHL 0002. 0014780, email racket to Mackenzie, 17 September 13. Now, I want to take you to the action plan that Aussie came up with to deal with this situation, uh, Ms Harris, but I, I see the time, Commissioner. Would I, I can continue to that document or I, I have a number of further to, questions. Uh, how long do you need altogether with this witness? Uh, is there any realistic prospect of finishing her evidence tonight? No, there is not, Commissioner. No, well, let's get to a point where you think there's a convenient uh, uh, interruption in the flow. Mm -hmm. I think in that case I'd like to take Ms Harris to the action plan and we yes. can stop after that. So the action plan uh, was circulated on the 27th of September 2013. Do you understand that, Ms Harris? And that action plan is at AHL 0002 0001 4772. So the, the misconduct was notified to Aussie on the 8th of August 2013. This action plan is circulated on the 27th of September 2013 by Rob Klenner. Could you explain who Rob Klenner is? Um, Rob Klenner at the time managed our relationships with our lenders. And Mr Klenner circulated this ac action plan to a number of people within Aussie who included Melanie Tompkins who seems to have been the broker who took over Mr Sahay's loans, is that right? Melanie Tompkins was the mobile business leader I who see. coordinated. So who, he, who was, he speaking? was part of her team, so she Thank was you. responsible. So we see 
that Mr Klenner tells everyone that due to recent developments, we thought it worthwhile to outline the list actions that have already been undertaken and proposed actions to deal with the matter. Uh, I want to direct you to 1C, loan pipeline. Oversee these loans to ensure that lenders are not applying any bias by way of association to Shiv Sahay to the borrowers or lodging brokers, client interactions, credit assessment and commission. What do you understand that to mean, Ms Harris? What bias was Mr Klenner worried about? Can I, I'll just take a minute. Yes. take it to be, and it's my interpretation, um, is that if there are existing loans that are actually bona fide loans with valid documentation to support them, that the customer not be disadvantaged by the fact that Mr Sahay had been, had conducted, had been um, fraudulent in other loan applications. I see. And the second action item relates to the Bank West portfolio and their letter of termination. And we see there 2C, once we have this information, assess our next steps in relation to cessation of trail on the total Shiv Sahay portfolio. Now, this is a topic that comes up again in subsequent communications, but I want to put to you this is the first uh, indication in these documents that um, Aussie is trying very hard to avoid the cessation of the trail commissions from the Bank West business. Aussie is asking the question, yes, about whether the trail commission on the total book would be removed. It's asking the question, yes. Yes. And then risk mitigation is the final action item, number five. Once we have worked through the previous steps, we will convene a working group. This is after we've worked out things like trail commission. We'll convene a working group with key internal stakeholders. Items to be discussed include review actions and outcomes, including sales compliance review of linked brokers, establish a position and strategy to deal with future eventualities, <laughs> namely borrower default and the resulting process, the approach lenders may take, Bankwest and Suncorp are the priorities there, and involvement or advice to third parties, industry bodies, PI providers, regulatory agencies and law enforcement. So the very final list on the action item was to consider the involvement or advice to regulatory agencies and law enforcement. Is that right? That's right. And yes. ASIC was not notified by Aussie Home Loans of Mr Sahay's conduct, were they? They weren't in this instance, no. No. We have notified them of other instances and you'd be aware of that. Why did Aussie Home Lo Loans not notify ASIC of this misconduct of Mr Sahay? I can't answer that. I can't give you reasons. And as for law enforcement, Aussie Home Loans did not make any report to the police about Mr Sahay's conduct? No, we didn't, no. And why did... Aussie Home Loans not make any such report? So the reports are normally made by the lenders because they are the ones that have the, the credit decision making and they're the ones with the expertise to determine exactly what the conduct is being diagnosed as or defined as. Uh, I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.50, uh, AHL 002, 001, uh, action plan, email, uh, uh, to Simmond and others, 27 September 13. Just before I leave that document, one last question, if the Commissioner wouldn't mind. There's nothing in this action plan about notifying any customer of Mr Sahay of this conduct, is there? No, there is not. No. Thank you. Uh, I'll... Um, continue my questions tomorrow, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms Harris, uh, I'll have to ask you to be back here in time to uh, begin at uh, 09.45 tomorrow uh, and we'll adjourn until 9.45 tomorrow.
at all. Uh, Commissioner Ms Harris. Yes, Ms Harris, would you mind going back into the witness box? Thank you. Obviously going to be a very long morning, Ms Hoare. It's two minutes to seven and seems to be stuck at two minutes to seven on the court clock, so it's going to be a very long day. <laughs> Oh. Ms Harris, I, I was asking you questions yesterday about the way Aussie Home Loans dealt with misconduct, fraudulent misconduct by Mr Shib Sahay. What? You recall That's that? Right. Yes. yes I do. And the last document that I had taken you to was a document that summarised the actions that um, uh, Aussie Home Loans was going to take in response to that misconduct. Do you recall that document? Um, I don't recall the exact document, yes. so someone could pull it up. I'll show you another document now. I want oh, okay. to move on in the chronology right. okay. uh, to the 12th of November 2013. I'll show you a document which is AHL 0002 0012456. And to assist you with the timeline, Ms Harris, the document that we looked at at the end of yesterday was dated the 27th of September 2013. Right. So this document is 12 November 2013 and it's a document put together by Aussie Home Loans to summarise the actions that its panel lenders have taken in response to Mr Sahay's misconduct as at this date. Is that right? That's right, yes. And we see there the following lenders have taken the following action and formally notified Aussie. Suncorp, letter of broker termination received 8 August 2013, brackets, no cessation of trail. Now that's a reference to the trail commissions payable to Aussie home loans in respect of Mr Sahay's loans. Standard fee, yes. yes. So Suncorp has not ceased paying those trail commissions. The second lender, Bank West, letter of broker termination dated 12 November 2013, cessation of trail commission noted. Do you see that? Yes, I Ms. do. Ms Harris? Yes. And a third lender, Homeside, letter of broker termination dated 22 October 2013. There appears to be no reference to cessation of trail commission there. Right. Uh, so Aussie at this point in going through the actions taken by lenders was concerned to understand which of the lenders were going to cease the trial commission payments to Aussie Home Loans and which were not. Is that right? As one of a number of elements we're looking at, yes. Yes. And we also see that uh, a number of lenders had verbally indicated to Aussie that they would review their loan portfolios introduced by Mr Sahay. Right, yes. Uh, and you see Mr Sahay's total Aussie portfolio as at the end of October 2013 reflected in that table? Yes, I do. So $70 million worth of loans from Mr Sahay as at the end of October 2013? Yes. 259 loans in total? Yes. You see that? Yes. So trail commissions were coming in on 259 loans valued at more than $70 million at this point. Now, over the page, you see the heading Financial Impact, Bank West Action. Yes, I do. Based on the Aussie portfolio data and rec reconciliation of this with Bank West, the immediate financial impact to Aussie will be approximately $2,000 per month. This amount does not include potential future increases in tra trail commission from Bank West as part of their, uh, I think that should be a reference to tiered, is that right? I would assume it's tiered, yes. yes. tiered yes. step up model. And is that a reference to the fact that the trail commission payments increase the longer the loan has been in place? No. Is that the tiered model? The tiered model is more around the quality of the, of the applications. I see. And can
can you explain what the potential future increases in trail commission from that model would have been for Mr Sahay's portfolio? I can't explain that, no. That, was, that would sit in other areas. Um, someone like David Smith would be able to explain that. Thank you. So at this point, the financial impact that Aussie is noting as a result of Mr Sahay's misconduct is a loss of approximately $2,000 per month um, uh, uh, on the uh, Bank West part of the portfolio. Is that right? That's right, yes, yes. And Aussie sets out what its proposed next steps are in the next section of the document. And the first next step is to challenge Bank West's decision to cease all trail commission payable on their Shib Sahay loan portfolio. You see that? Yes, I do. That's what it says, yes. And do you know whether or not there was a challenge to Bank West's decision to cease the trial commission payable on Mr Sahay's portfolio? I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know. Right. You don't know whether it was done, nor if it was done, what the result was? No, I don't. I'm but sorry. we can see from this document that that was something that Aussie Home Loans decided to do uh, in November 2013 in response to Mr Sahay's misconduct. I can see on this document that that was one of several steps that were proposed. Um, I can't guarantee, I can't, I simply don't have the knowledge to be able to tell you that it actually happened. Well, Ms Harris, you've been put forward by Aussie Home Loans as the witness to explain to this Royal Commission mm -hmm. Aussie Home Loans handling of these four former brokers misconduct. Are you unable to tell this Royal Commission whether Aussie Home Loans did challenge Bank West's decision to cease trail commission payments in respect of Mr Sahay's portfolio? I'm sorry, but yes, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, I have familiarity with the process that was followed, the actual relationships with our lenders post that and what actually happens does not necessarily, does not sit in my area. Yes, I see. And uh, the other witnesses put forward by Aussie Home Loans were also not involved in these events? The other witnesses, one was not there at the time. One of the other witnesses who I mentioned, David Smith actually manages now the lender relationships. Yes. He didn't manage it then, yes. but he would know what our practice is with lenders. Yes, but none of you will be able to answer my questions about the action that Aussie Home Loans took in November 2013 in relation to Mr Sahay's misconduct? I'm not saying that Mr Smith can't. I'm simply saying that I can't guarantee he will. I haven't actually asked him specifically. You know, don't you, Ms Harris, that Mr Smith's statement doesn't deal with these events of misconduct at all? It right. is all dealt with in your witness statement. Okay, because I haven't seen the other witness statements, so I'm not aware of what's involved in the other ones. So you can't assist the Royal Commission further on this? On that particular question? No, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about the process and to talk about how we manage both the brokers and the customers. Um, but on that particular question, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, we can certainly find out and that can be tabled at a later time. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. With 1.51, uh, AHL 0002 001 uh, panel lender summary, 12 November 13. Ms Harris, can I take you slightly forward in time to the 10th of December 2013 mm -hmm. when an issue arose with another customer of Mr Sahay's? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll show you a document, AHL 0002 0015017. This is an email from uh, William Fitzgerald to Chris Meakin, William Fitzgerald being a risk management officer. That's right. Uh, Chris Meakin being another Aussie Home Loans employee. Is yes. that right? Yes, she was in customer disputes, yes. I he was in? Customer disputes. Thank you. Hi Chris, Mel T sales manager will be giving you a call shortly for some advice regarding a potential customer complaint that is formulating and has some background with the Shiv incident. Essentially the customer has been told they are eligible for a FHOG, is that a reference to a first homeowners grant? Yes. When they are not and appear to have a big funds shortfall, i.e. circa 25,000 
loan has already been approved but looks unlikely to settle. Mel is going back to the broker to get more details, but there probably should be a few people across this one due to the potential insurance angle also. Yes, I guess. Yes. I'll move on to a, a further document, but first I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.52, AHL 0002-001-5017, email Fitzgerald to Meekin, 10 December 2013. Now that email that I've uh, just shown you, Ms Harris, was dated, I'm sorry, it was from 9.35am on the 10th of December. Can I now show you a, an email from later on the same day at 5.05 that afternoon, AHL 0002 0001 Perhaps we could have both pages of this two-page email on the screen. So I can show you, Ms Harris, that this is an email from Melanie Tompkins, Sales Manager Mobile. M Melanie Tompkins is, um, uh, has been involved in emails we looked at yesterday, yes, is that that's right? right? Yes. Uh, and the email is to Andrew Rasby, another person within Aussie Home Loans, is that right? Um, at that time, yes. And what was Andrew's position? He was New South Wales ACT State Manager. And a number of other uh, Aussie employees are copied on the email, in including Chris Meakin, who we saw on the previous email. Is that right? That's right, yes. Now, uh, there's a bit of detail in this email, uh, Ms Harris, but it's important that I, I take you to that detail. Uh, this is Melanie Tonkin, Tompkins telling uh, Andrew Rasby that she needs to run something past him. You'll see that the subject line is urgent issue, previous Shib Sahay deal. Second paragraph, Shib Sahay was terminated with Aussie in August after Suncorp revoked his accreditations. Further file reviews by both Aussie and other lenders on our panel have indicated there may be further concerns on top of those identified by Suncorp. And then a summary is provided of a customer's situation, a customer who had got in contact with Aussie. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. And the summary is single female applicant, husband not included due to adverse credit history. I will endeavour to get the EDA report not on file from Shiv. What is a VEDA report? Um, VEDA is a report that um, talks about the credit rating of the individual and I has see. a history of credit inquiries. Land loan for a client with Suncorp. Loan amount 267,000, purchase price 293,000. Loan drawn 5 June 2013. First homeowner's grant application form submitted to Suncorp as part of application. Copy not on file. Above loan incurred mortgage insurance of $3,556.70, a peer's deposit of $26,000 paid from customers' genuine savings. Construction loan $383,000 submitted prior to SHIB's termination. Construction tender $400,257. Loan amount since, since amended to $353,750 due to servicing issues. Loan unconditionally approved prior to SHIV terminating. New broker, Kira Hooper, now this is someone who would have been allocated to this That's customer's right. file after Mr Sahay was terminated, is That's that right. right? Yes. New broker, Kira Hooper, picked up file, contacted clients and introduced self and confirmed status of the deal. Approval expired. Kira made contact with clients and they and husband advised applicant was in hospital, having just given birth. They were not aware they were pregnant and baby was around 13 weeks premature and not in a good way. Kira advised she needed to reassess loan as Suncorp required her to state no change to circumstances and she couldn't do that. Initial calculations indicated it didn't service and Kira was researching if it could be done with an alternate lender. Clients contacted Suncorp directly and extended approval. As baby was in critical condition, Kira didn't advise Suncorp of change in circumstances at this stage, as clients indicated baby not expected to survive. 
Notification received that additional information needed to be provided with First Home Owners Grant as SHIV had not included, including contract of sale for land and signed building tender. OSR, could you tell us who OSR is? Office of State Revenue, I would assume. Thank you. Uh, responsible for the administration of First Home Owners Grants, yes. is that right? So OSR advised Suncorp that First Home Owners Grant had been declined due to value exceeding 650,000. So far clients have paid 32,000, including a gift of 12,500 to the builder and another $26,000 deposit on the land. There will be a shortfall of close to 15,000 due to First Home Owners Grant not being received. Until all loan funds are paid towards the construction, Suncorp will not release first progress payment. Construction has not commenced, but is due in the very near future. Now, client has not been advised of first homeowner's grant being declined at this stage, as I have advised Kira to hold off until advised on best way to communicate this and possible solutions. Impact to Aussie brand and potential financial claims are likely, as client is in an extremely fragile state and have paid considerable savings towards this purchase already. Clients would be potentially liable for the full amount paid to the builder if construction didn't proceed. I would appreciate some guidance on what approach could be taken with this one, what our responsibilities are, and also the best way to discuss with the client. Now, are you familiar with how Aussie handled this customer's uh, issues, Ms Harris? I am familiar superficially with the process that was followed here. Um, I can't give you a categoric, um, a categoric outline of the actual steps that happened after this. I can certainly tell you that according to our records, we have not paid any compensation. So I would assume a further investigation happened. The other thing that I'd add about this one is it's an incredibly sad example. And obviously the new broker was struggling with what do they do when a family is in a very traumatic stage. And I can understand that. Mm. The family was in, as you describe it, a traumatic stage and they weren't told, were they, of what had happened with Mr Sahay? No, they weren't. No. Yes. And this no. was a situation where a customer had got an unconditionally approved loan through Mr Sahay in circumstances where the first homeowner's grant had been factored into the serviceability assessment and the application form for that grant had been submitted to Suncorp as part of the application. And then the customer was unable to service the loan and the first homeowner's grant was denied. That's right? Yes, that's what I believe, yes. Uh, and instead of talking to this customer uh, about Mr Sahay's misconduct, uh, which it appears extends to having factored in a grant that had not been made into the serviceability assessment for this customer's loan, the customer was told nothing about that. Is that right? So the customer was certainly told that Mr Sahay had left. Yes. Um, if, if we actually look at, the, at what we can and can't say, and um, we are guided by legal advice on what we can and can't say, um, at this point, we didn't have categoric proof, highly likely, we all believed it, but we didn't have categoric, tangible, technical definition of fraud and what actually happened. So our focus in these situations is to focus on trying to look after the customer the best way we can, rather than go through with the customer information about Mr Sahay, who at that stage had not been proven guilty. I'm not doubting he did the wrong thing. I'm not doubting that this was misconduct. So please believe that, I'm not doubting that. But it's a really difficult situation during this period of, of working out what do you say and what don't you say when, when there hasn't been actual proven conviction? I want to ask you about that, Ms Harris, because over the course of a single day, a single day file review was enough for Aussie Home Loans to decide that Mr Sahay's conduct um, was so egregious that he ought be terminated with immediate effect at the end of that day. You agreed with that yesterday? And 
I agreed with that and I agreed with that on the basis that there was sufficient evidence to us that he did not follow the Aussie processes and procedures and was not complying with what we believed responsible lending should be. That's right. That's a very different thing to the definition of fraud. That's the but only point that I'm wanting to you make. You didn't here. even tell the customer that first bit that Aussie home loans following a review of files had formed the view that you just articulated. Not even that piece of information was provided to the customer, was it? Um, probably not, no. No. Uh, and you talked about the focus of Aussie, Aussie home loans at this stage being to do what's in the best interests of the client. You don't think it would have been in the best interests of this client to explain Aussie's position on the conduct of this broker who had put through her unconditionally approved loan that ought never have been approved? I think in this situation, I'm, I'm sorry, perhaps we're differing here. I think in this situation, our focus needs to be on the customer to see whether we can possibly get some solution for the customer. Um, so I, it's, it's the customer first in my book and, and obviously that's well, different. I'm going to put to you directly, Ms Harris, that this email re reveals that the focus was not on the customer and the customer's interests. The focus was on the impact to the Aussie brand and potential financial claims being made against Aussie by this client. I agree that that's the last part of that, but there's also in previous emails and there's also the concern here about looking after the customer as well. Um, it's, got, it's always going to be a balance. Yes, and the balance wasn't right here, was it, Ms Harris? I don't think we have enough effort we're putting in with the customer. To put how much? How much, how much effort we're putting in to try to resolve the customer's issues in this case. I see. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. 1.53 AHL 0802 uh, 001 uh, 4804 email Tompkins to RASB 10 December 2013. Oh, thank you. At some point, Ms. Harris, asked Just before you go on, Ms. Yes. Orr, uh, the client was told that Mr. Sahay had left, is that right? That's right. Didn't think of telling the client that. Uh, Mr. Sahay's engagement had been terminated? It's actually difficult in that situation when the, when the customer is going through what is a stressful process of applying for a home loan to put additional stress on them by saying he was terminated for, because then they start to think about other things. Our focus is on if we could possibly look after the customer and get them what they're needing um, that that should actually be the first priority. Yes. At some point, Ms. Harris, ASIC became involved in relation to Mr. Sahay's misconduct, did they not? They did, yes. Uh, and do you know how ASIC came to um, be involved? I believe Bank West notified them. Mm. And the ASIC investigation that was conducted. Uh, revealed that Mr Sahay, while acting as Aussie's uh, credit representative, had made false statements in applications and created and used false bank statements for 17 of his clients yes. for the purposes of securing home loans totalling approximately $7 million. It was, that, that was the case and it's completely and utterly unacceptable. And those home loans were all through Bank West and Suncorp? They, this particular, Shiv Sahay seemed to put his loans in those areas, yes. Well, he didn't put all of his loans through Bank West and Suncorp, did he? No, not all. No, no. We, we saw that you notified multiple yes, panel lenders in the about one. his termination. Yes. yes. Uh, but what I've just referred to, the 17 clients for which there was a finding that he'd made false statements and used false bank statements, Yes. Uh, they were all Bank West and Suncorp clients. And we know that not as a result of any investigation undertaken by Aussie, but as a result of investigations and action taken by Bank West and Suncorp. Is that right? That's right. So the lenders each will do an investigation, having received an alert from us that they need to look at the files. Yes. And Mr. Hay was uh, subsequent. Mr. Sahay was subsequently charged with criminal offences. Is that right? He was. Uh, and he was convicted of those criminal offences, having pleaded guilty? He was. And you've uh, 
uh, explained the nature of those criminal offences in paragraph 44 of your statement. There were 13 false statements made in loan applications submitted on behalf of clients to Bank West and Suncorp, 23 false documents in support of those false statements, primarily bank statements, and he used 26 false documents in loan applications he submitted uh, to uh, Bank West. Right, he pleaded guilty to those, yes. Yes, and Aussie Home Loans never worked out whether Mr Sahay's criminal conduct had also affected loans with other lenders? We, as I said before, we notified the lenders and we asked them to look. We looked after the customers that were in the process of having a loan approved or settled um, and then practice in um, the aggregator market is that the lenders look after the customers after that and that's primarily because you get that who owns the customer. So whilst we will keep in contact with the customers, um, the decision about these kind of things is done by the lender and actions are done by the lender. Right. That's what we believe, that's what we ask the lenders to do and that's what they agree to do. So I think the answer to my question is yes, Aussie Home Loans never worked out whether Mr Sahay's criminal conduct, <coughs> excuse me, affected loans with other lenders. Is the answer to that question yes? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> now, did Aussie Home Loans uh, report Mr Sahay's misconduct to the MFAA? Um, no, we didn't, no. And why not, Ms Harris? I don't know and I've been asking exactly that question. It's, well, we should be reporting it to the MFAA. I talked yesterday, I know, about the importance yes. of the MFAA in doing that. Um, and so far I have not had a reasonable explanation as to why we didn't, but we didn't. Yes, so your evidence yesterday was that uh, in answer to my question, why has Aussie chosen the MFAA yep. rather than the FBAA, you said it was quite a few years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is transcript 312 at line 37. But at the time, the MFAA was the only association which expelled brokers. Yes. So there was a level of frustration in Aussie that we would terminate a broker for doing the wrong thing and they would go and work for someone else. So we actually applied to the ACCC for us to be able to dictate that all of our brokers needed to be a member of the MFAA as opposed to the MFAA or the FBAA. We believed it was a more rigorous organisation. That was your evidence? That, that was my evidence and that's what <coughs> I still believe very strongly. And you can't explain why I can't, what in I the can face say. of this misconduct there was no report to the MFAA by Aussie Home Loans? I cannot explain why. I can, <coughs> I can certainly say that there was clearly a lapse in our process. We should have done it. We do do it now, so there is a very diligent process now, but we didn't at that case. There was, a, there was that period when, for whatever reason, we weren't doing what we should have been doing. We're, we're looking at it, we're making sure that we're fixing it. This is about identifying these things and trying to come up with, not trying, coming up with solutions. I'm going to ask you today about uh, uh, misconduct of four former yes. brokers from yes. Aussie Home Loans. Mr Sahay is the first in time yes, in is. 2013. How many of those did you notify the misconduct to MFAA? We notified the number four. Just the last one. Yep. So the, the case with these three, we did not notify them. No. So there was that period, as I said. Um, a a lengthy was period, was it not, Ms Harris? It was a lapse in our process and it was over a lengthy period. Yes. And we, it shouldn't have happened. Could I show you uh, another document, AHL 0002 0015035. This is a letter or an email from the MFAA to Aussie Home Loans on the 3rd of February 2014. Yes. So you terminated Mr Sahay on the 8th of August 2013, but it's the MFAA who tells you in February 2014 that they've made a determination to expel Mr Sahay. That's right. And yes. you don't know how the MFAA came to be aware of uh, Mr Sahay's misconduct? No. No. Oh, sorry. Tend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.54, AHL, 0002, 0015035, email from Kennedy, 3 February 2014. 
that one of the lenders notified them, but I can't categorically yes. say that. Could we turn to the second broker who you deal with in your statement, yes. Ms Harris. Um, that's a broker by the name of Emma Khalil, K-H-A-L-I-L. -L. That's right. Uh, now, Aussie first became aware of Ms Khalil's misconduct on the 5th or 6th of March 2014. Is that right? That's right. And how did Aussie become aware of that misconduct? Um, notification by the lender. And which lender? Um, I have to go back. Uh, I'm mixing them up. You deal with um, this in paragraph 71 of your statement, oh, do you? do Ms I? Harris. Okay. Uh, it was Westpac, that's right. Yeah. It was Westpac um, related to their product features at the time. So as with Mr Sahay, Aussie found out about fraudulent misconduct on the part of one of its brokers from a lender, not from anything connected with its own processes. No, that's right. So Aussie's processes, again, didn't prevent this misconduct from occurring, nor did they detect the misconduct when it had occurred. I think that's absolutely true, yes. And this is some time after the events involving Mr Sahay. Those events were back in August 2013. Yes. We're now in March 2014, and Aussie's processes had not been improved in a way that prevented or detected this misconduct. Aussie's processes did not identify this particular example, but we, we were reviewing files. We were attempting to start a really rigorous compliance program. Um, and we certainly had very clearly the expectation in the business that we, we should be looking for brokers that do the wrong thing. And if we find brokers that do the wrong thing there and that that's proven, then we will terminate their contract. So um, very clearly that was the expectation. And the expectation was you'd terminate their contract and that would be the end of it, wasn't it? The, In it particular, be, there was no expectation that you'd report it to any authority. The, expect, the expectation was that it would have been reported. It wasn't reported. You're absolutely reported right. Reported to whom? Um, the expectation was that it should have certainly have been reported to the MFAA. But not um, to ASIC or any other regulatory authority. No, that with we were also talking about reporting to ASIC. You were talking about. We, we were to talking ASIC. about the need for us to start reporting to ASIC at the same time. Um, this particular misconduct of Ms. Khalil uh, was detected by Westpac because there was an anomaly that they recognised. Do you see the reference that you make to that in paragraph 71 of your statement? Yes, I do. The customer had applied for a credit card at a Westpac branch and the credit card application was independent of Ms Khalil and Aussie Home Loans. The credit card application recorded details of income that was materially inconsistent with those provided in the application. We need the next page. That's right. Submitted by Ms Khalil. This prompted a review of the customer's home loan application, a review by Westpac, and the issue centred on Ms Khalil's clients using potentially fraudulent letters of employment as proof of income in submitting applications to Westpac. Um, why didn't Aussie detect Ms Khalil using potentially fraudulent letters of employment as proof of income in her loan applications? So clearly our compliance team did, didn't pick it up and the line one compliance being the mobile business leader did not pick it up either. Do you know anything about the details of what made the letters of employment fraudulent? Uh, yes, so there, there were the same employer sometimes, the same numbers sometimes. Um, um, so, so when you're looking at a series of applications, there should have been, we should have recognised the pattern. Yes. On their own, perhaps not. But certainly, if you put deals one behind the other, then we should have. Well, I, I want to put to you, Ms Harris, that it wasn't difficult at all to detect this fraud. The same employer appeared as the employer of multiple clients who yes. Ms Khalil was submitting home loan applications for. The letters of employment, according to your Aussie documents, were all in a very similar format, in the similar font. They all had very similar detail. You accept yes. all of that? Yes. We should, we should have picked it up. Yes. yes. 
Well, at, at this time, did Aussie have some sort of fraud team or some sort of program designed to detect these anomalies? We were a, we're a small organisation. We would have had about 200 people there, plus the brokers. Um, we had a compliance team, and the compliance team's role was to review files and to investigate further if um, any particularly an, particular anomalies, <laughs> anomalies sorry, um, becomes apparent. Um, we have since then significantly beefed up, beefed up that compliance team and we're about to beef it up even more with line one compliance roles. So we recognise that we need, we recognise now that we need far more resources in order to do that effectively. Plus obviously the number of customers and brokers have increased. Is there a fraud team now within Aussie? There is not a fraud team. There is a compliance team that will be looking at these things. And how many people are in that compliance team that will be looking at these things? Um, the risk and compliance team now totals nine. That's at level. That's the um, second level. Um, the first level we have we have the mobile business leaders that I've talked about and the retail business consultants. Um, so there are 27 of those. Um, and in addition, we've got two centralised roles, which we're actually repurposing. So the centralised roles were more around coaching in credit. We're repurposing them so that we can take advantage of the broker dashboard that we're developing. Mm -hmm. So the broker dashboard will actually, it, it comes out of Power BI and it's got a process flow related to sale, coming out of Salesforce. And what that dashboard will do is allow us to look at every broker under a number of different categories. So, you know, rework, funds to complete, um, living expenses, those kind of things, so that we can be looking across the board at all our, all our broker group. And then we are then going to be more able or more able to identify and recognise if there are patterns. So someone, it's, it's coded red, green, yellow, the obvious thing. So as soon as there is multiple red, um, there is the capacity then to say, OK, we need to drill down more into what that particular broker is doing. Right, so that centralised team will be coordinating that and then we're putting another five resources into each of the states. That will be that line one working in the state office, actually doing doing um, checking, checking the files and actually working with the brokers to make sure they are, they are understanding if there are areas that they're not meeting NCCP requirements, that, that they understand very quickly and are given the skills and knowledge on how to do that. How will that system, which as I understand it is not yet operational, these are things you are developing, is that right? Uh, I saw a draft of the broker dashboard a week yes. ago, so, so it's, very, it's very close. Right. We've just got to make sure that the data in it is accurate, but it's, it's certainly built and we're testing it. Yes, but not yet implemented. Not right now, no. 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 But uh, it, we're all in the testing, we're, fight, we're actually picking up some patterns already. So it's just that, that patterns testing. Patterns of misconduct by your brokers. We're just picking, we, we can see what brokers are doing what already. So what I'm saying there is that we are starting as a pilot, as a test. I can't categorically tell you the results, um, but it's in a form where we can test and, and test scenarios and test things so that it is able already to give us trends. We don't know, as I said at the outset, that the data is accurate, so we can't actually act on it, um, but we certainly are very confident it will give us far greater ability to look, identify trends and start preventing, which is what should have happened with these. So your point is absolutely valid. So what sort of things have you picked up already in the pilot phase? Um, we have, we're identifying um, where there seems to be trends, going back to discussion before about um, living expenses sitting on him. So why are they doing that? So let's have a conversation with a broker about whether that's justifiable or not. So that's some of the things that we're starting to identify. And what other things are you starting to identify? Um, brokers that have high rework, which would suggest that they're not necessarily taking, they're not putting in all the documents in the way it should and rework can potentially affect a customer. So we need to talk to the broker about making sure that they are providing the documents as the lender is asking for, um, so that the deal preferably goes through quicker. Any other things that you've picked up in the pilot phase? Um, they were just, they were a couple that I noticed when we had the demonstration. And how will this new system detect fraudulent conduct? So there is, the, there is the ability in the system 
to look at supporting documentation and supporting documentation is related to this. So it will show if there is indications of any issues and it will then allow our compliance team to look in more detail about the loan applications for that broker and see it in that sequence that I talked about earlier. Is the supporting documentation logged into the system or does the system just record the form of supporting documentation that was submitted by the broker? The, the system, often the supporting documentation is separate. Depends on whether the supporting documentation is in Toolbox, which is our system. So the supporting documentation itself is not loaded into the system? No, because it's based on Power BI, so it's a data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it will show where there are supporting documentation, um, but, but it will allow people I'm then to dig in that. I'm asking this because I want to understand how you're going to identify the fraudulent supporting documentation that wasn't identified for Ms Khalil, where multiple clients have letters of employment from the same employer in the same style being submitted by the broker. And that's a valid comment. I can't tell you exactly how that's going to work, except that that's one of the key objectives of this tool, for us to be able to pick up issues like that a lot earlier than we have up until now. Well, that objective will fail if the documents themselves aren't part of the system, won't it? Because you need to be able to look at the face of the letter of employment and see that it's in the same style and from the same employer as another client. It, it will trigger pulling up the supporting documentation and looking at that supporting documentation. That's what I'm trying to understand. What will trigger that, Ms Harris? What will, what will trigger that is a pattern. What will trigger that is whether they're supporting documentation or not. Um, and so the, that pattern. I think that we need, and I can't, I'm not the technical person here, I'm sorry, um, but I think we need to make sure we build in to the broker dashboard some way of determining the supporting documentation. I can't tell you how that's done within Power BI, um, but that's, that's what we should be doing. That would seem to be a good idea in light of the misconduct of just the four particular brokers you focused on in your statement, would it not? It, it would. Yes. So just to be clear, I've seen, I've seen a demonstration of the tool for 20 minutes. I haven't been involved in the build process of it. I've seen the, I've seen the demonstration of it. It's given me a high level of confidence. And um, as a business, we are very excited about having a tool like this. The more technical things of how does it work and what do they pull and where does it pull from, um, I'm not the expert in that. I can say that supporting documentation will be a critical area of focus for us. I can certainly say that. You just don't know how that's going to work. I, I don't know technically. Yes. Okay. Not... Okay. Could we go back to Ms Khalil? Yes. Who in 2014, March 2014, Westpac tells you um, <coughs> is involved in what they suspect to be fraudulent misconduct. Yes. Uh, can I take you to an Aussie document uh, in light of that? disclosure, AHL 00020013235. Thank you. Now, uh, I think we need to pull, yes, thank you, pull up the next page as well. So we have two communications here on the 6th of March uh, within Aussie. Uh, the first is the one on the right side of the page at 3.31 p.m. from uh, Shane Wilson, yes. a sales manager for mobile, to Matthew... Uh, she was a mobile business leader, yes. Yes. Uh, to Matthew White. Yes. Who is Matthew White? He was the Queensland Northern Territory... Well, is the Queensland Northern Territory step manager. Okay. And so, uh, Ms Wilson, is that right? Ms Wilson? Yes, a Ms. Yes. yes. Ms Wilson is uh, telling Mr White uh, that Emma Khalil has been lodging deals with Westpac using letter of employment as only source of income. Yes. And this has come to light yesterday, as one of the loans that was due to settle has fallen over due to anomalies. You see that? Yes, I do. Uh, the Westpac staff member who was processing the credit card application reported this to the housing area, which has now resulted in the file being investigated further. Now, do you see the next paragraph refers to Ms Wilson having spoken to Emma in length today? 
to yes. understand what has occurred. That's right, yes. Emma has indicated that she's done quite a few loans with Westpac recently using the letter of employment, which Emma supplies the draft copy to applicant and or employer. The draft letter could certainly be, now draft letter of employment, uh, could certainly be just the wording for employer to follow. I asked Emma if she was aware of her knowingly doing anything that wasn't honest and, that, and she stated that she was all okay with the process. I also asked Emma if she kept very good diary notes to ensure <coughs> that if any questions were raised she could support herself with her file notes. Emma does not keep good diary notes and timeline of events. If we move another paragraph down, Emma had also asked me what would happen if she was found to have done something wrong. I explained that she could lose her Aussie agreement, lose her income and trail book, as well as be blacklisted with MFAA. Emma was showing visible signs of stress and worry. Now, can I ask you to look at the next email at 7.21 that day? Matthew White to Stephen McKenzie. Who was Mr McKenzie? Mr McKenzie was the head of sales operations, so he was in charge of the compliance team and he was in charge of um, making sure that further investigations would be done. Mm. And I, I want to direct you to a part of the first paragraph where Mr White says to Mr McKenzie, uh, he refers to a meeting that they're going to have with Emma. I will ensure that the focus of the meeting is not to make any accusations or deliver any disciplinary action, but rather to find out as much as we can about the file in question. I will, however, confirm to her that if Westpac find that there was fraudulent activity on her part and revoke her accreditation, then that will in effect put her in breach of her contract and ultimately result in her termination from Aussie. <coughs> Further down, can you please contact Westpac to initiate an audit of loan files once note, ones noted below are related to the file in question? I assume this will trigger an internal audit from Aussie's end on a number of recent files scanned by Emma. Can you also please ask Westpac if they have already commenced an investigation yet and initial findings? This will determine whether we suspend Emma immediately pending outcome of Westpac investigation or whether we wait until the findings are advised back to us. And then there's a reference to potential pending legal action. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, why was the issue of Ms Khalil's termination by Aussie Home Loans for fraud left in the hands of a third party, left in the hands of the lender? Whatever action Aussie was to take was going to be dependent upon the action taken by Westpac. Why is that? So Westpac, and in fact all the large banks, have credit specialists and fraud teams that have the expertise to be able to determine fraud. We don't have that. So we are reliant on the lenders to provide that expertise because they are ultimately the, the organisation that's approving the loan. So, you know, we are the front end and we don't have those skills. We have people to check and to look at files, but the legal definition which is what you're going to need in these cases, you need a legal definition that's defensible, um, is very difficult for us to do. Um, we had a broker who was arguing, uh, what she did was appalling, so please I'm not justifying that, um, but we had a broker who was arguing very strongly that she had not done this, so you've, you know, we were not in a position to know who had done what, how, where, 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 where when, um, and so for that reason, it's actually the prudent, I think, and responsible thing for us to go to the lender who have those skills and expertise for them to make a determination. And the thing I'd stress here is that there, you know, there is never any doubt that we will terminate if the person has done the wrong thing. And in this case, they did the wrong thing. But right at the beginning, it's often quite difficult to know exactly what is the truth and what isn't and how you best handle it. Well, what I want to put to you, Ms Harris, is that it's not good enough. It's not good enough that Aussie Home Loans outsources to a third party investigations of fraudulent conduct made against one of its own employees. What do you say to that? Made against an uh, independent contractor who operates with us. Um, so they're not, they're not an employee is what I'm 
Oh, I'm sorry. You're wanting yeah. to. Uh, you're yeah. referring to my characterisation of Ms. Khalil as, yes, an employee. as an employee. I understand. So, yeah. an independent co contractor engaged by you and operating under your brand yes. as an Aussie broker. What I'm putting to you is that it's not good enough that you outsource entirely your obligation to look into a serious allegation of fraudulent misconduct. Um, you outsource that to a third party, and your action is entirely dependent upon the actions of that third party. We, we are outsourcing it to a third party that's directly related to the situation and they have a level of expertise that we simply don't hear, have within our business. Well, and they are the ones who are responsible for, for providing the home loan. Do you think you will develop that expertise within your business, Ms Harris? I think it's, I think it's a very difficult, difficult area. Um, I don't know how... how what we would have to do to set up a unit that is big enough and robust enough to be able to make these determinations. Um, especially when we have lender partners who have units to do this. They have people, they have teams that do nothing but this. We're not big enough to be able to justify that. So I think it's appropriate to find the best third party we can with some some interest, some relationship in the particular situation and ask them to determine that. Well, can I just see if I can summarise where we've got to? Because uh, is it open to me to conclude from your evidence that at the time of the Halil events yes. and earlier, uh, Aussie was of the view that it was for the lender and not Aussie to investigate and determine whether there was fraud associated with uh, one or more particular transactions. Yes, so our compliance team were responsible for highlighting if there were issues and anomalies, um, but that the lender would be the one determining fraud, yes. Is it open to me to conclude from what you have told me that it remains Aussie's view that it is for the lender, not Aussie, to investigate and determine whether there was fraud associated with one or more uh, transactions. So it's slightly different now, sir, in that um, because we have and we're a wholly owned company under CBA, we now have access to that fraud, those expertise that I talked about earlier, um, so we can actually get their input and seek their expertise in these situations. In respect of a transaction made with a bank other than CBA? Sorry, say that again. In sorry. respect of a transaction yeah. made with a bank other than CBA? If you there call is... on the CBA fraud team, for example, to take a random case, uh, with respect to a loan with ANZ or Westpac or NAB? Well, they are, they, yes, so they are able, they're, they're the same as us having our own fraud team, which is what we're talking about here. Um, they provide the same support, so they are in a better position to be able to determine that definition. I keep coming back to the definition of fraud, you know, that, that we can provide anomalies or evidence or indications of anomalies, but they are in a much stronger position. Um, and so now with the CBA piece, yes, they would be potentially, I can't think of a time, sir, but they would potentially be in a position to be looking at supporting documentations, which um, were, you know, has already been identified, tends to be the area where fraud is committed. Am I to also understand from your evidence that at the time of the Halil and uh, earlier events, uh, Aussie was of the view that it was for the lender, not Aussie, to deal with the client in respect of a drawn down loan. Once the loan has settled, yes, we notify the lenders and ask them to contact the customer if required. And is that still the position uh, of Aussie today, that it is for the lender, not for Aussie, to deal with the client in respect of a drawn it loan? In respect to any potential fraud, obviously we keep in contact with the customer, but on this particular area, yes. The last matter I want to take up with you is 
that am I to understand from your evidence that at the time of the events of uh, Sahay and Khalil, yeah. uh, the only steps Aussie uh, took uh, with respect to the broker were to terminate his or her engagement with Aussie? Yes. In fact, in those events, it did not notify or deal with MFAA? No, there was a gap in our process at that time, yes. And in particular, Aussie made no report of any kind to any regulatory authority? That is what appears, yes. Yeah. Yes, Ms. And, and what I need to <coughs> add to that is that is a real gap. We should be, we should have done then, we should be now, sir. I'm absolutely acknowledging that. Ms Harris, the two pages that are on the screen are the last two pages in an email chain. Could I ask for the first two pages of that email chain to also be brought up on the screen, which are 3233 and 3234? Uh, I show this to you, Ms Harris, because I want to tender the entirety of this document. You'll see that the first page there is a note recording Ms Khalil's account of events in the interview that was subsequently conducted by Aussie uh, with Ms Khalil and her husband on the 7th of March. Yes. Uh, I tender the document that commences with AHL 0002 0013233, uh, an email from uh, Matthew White to Joanne Gilby, dated the 7th of March 2014. That'll be Exhibit 1.55. Ms Harris, could you please look at AHL 0002 0010174? Sorry, is that is that what's going to be on the screen? It's coming oh, okay. now, Ms Harris. Thank you. Sorry. And this again is a multi-page email chain. Uh, now, can I ask you to turn within it to? Uh, 175, which I think is the page we have on the second half of the screen. Oh, okay, right. Do you see there that on the 13th of March, a few days later, Joanne Gilby, whose name is cut off, appears on the, oh, you can see it on the from, on the email. Yes. Joanne G Gilby is telling Mr McKenzie that she recommends immediate suspension of Ms Khalil. Yes. The volume and similarities in the letters of employment indicate that at the very least the broker has been negligent in her role if she was not an active participant. On our credit matrix, Westpac is the only lender that accepts only a letter of employment as the sole form of income verification when the LVR... Loan to value yes. ratio. Yes, and, and I assume there were probably meant to be some words that followed that about the LVR, but yeah. we don't have them. Yes, I would assume that it's something to do with the... Yes, the particular so. LVR. Uh, so on the 13th of March, a recommendation for the immediate suspension of Ms Khalil. Yes. And uh, on the previous page, uh, 174, we see that Stephen McKenzie supports that recommendation. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.56, uh, email. Uh, Simon to Mackenzie, 13 March 2014, associated email. Uh, that's AHL 002 0001-0174. Ms Khalil was suspended from Aussie Home Loans on the 13th of March 2014. Yes. And her accreditation was withdrawn by Westpac yes. uh, the following day, the 14th of March. And following that... Uh, withdrawal of her Westpac accreditation, Aussie sent suspension notices to Ms Khalil's company as well. Is that right? Yes. And on the 25th of March, there was internal discussion about uh, potential revocation uh, of Ms Khalil's accreditation. If we go to, thank you, AHL 0002 
Now, if we could turn to 3319. Mr. White, Mr. Oh, do we have? There we go. On the 25th of March, Mr. White, in an email to a number of people at Aussie, says he's needing to get some clarity on where to from here. What we know is, one, that Westpac will be revoking Emma's accreditation. Now, as it turns out, they had in fact already revoked her accreditation on the 14th of March, but Mr White uh, appears not to be aware of that in this email. Um, Customer is accusing Emma of fraudulent activity and are seeking restitution of deposit that has been forfeited due to inability to settle on purchase of property, has threatened to go to today tonight. And then down the bottom, based on Westpac's decision to revoke accreditation, I will have to terminate Emma. Can you please provide the termination letter so that I can advise her? You see that? Yes. Um, so the decision to terminate Ms Khalil was based on Westpac's decision to revoke her accreditation. Yes, so she, as soon as they revoke her accreditation, she breaches her contract and therefore termination of the agreement occurs. Yes, that was yes. the basis for the termination. Yes. Thank you. And if we go to 3317, the first email in this chain. We see an email from Aussie's Corporate Council to a number of people within Aussie, uh, including Matthew White. As discussed on the phone, to ensure we have a robust legal position, the termination letter should outline all breaches of the agreement and any misconduct by the broker. By undertaking an investigation of the matters and outlining all issues and breaches in depth, we are strengthening Aussie's legal position and our right to terminate. What we want to avoid is any argument by Ms Khalil that termination of the agreement, as well as her future income stream through the life loyalty bonus by Aussie was incorrect, unjust or a penalty. To this end, the more detail and breaches that we can outline in the termination letter, the better placed Aussie will be in future to rebut legal proceedings. So could you explain what Ms Khalil's future income stream through the life loyalty bonus would be? So that would be the trail bonus. That's the, the trail, trail commission, is it? That's right. Uh, so are the two things referring to the same thing there, the future income stream and the life loyalty bonus, are they both references to her trail commissions? Yes, they would be. I see. Uh, so this is about consideration of whether the trail commissions that are going to be paid by the lender to Aussie, a proportion of those will need to continue to be paid on to Ms Khalil. Is that right? No, 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 it's not that. So. Um, this is a legal team mm -hmm. being conservative and robust in their process. Um, as far as I'm aware, when someone loses their accreditation, I'm very comfortable for us to terminate straight away. The legal team is saying, what, what other information do we have in order to have a robust case? I, I understand that. I want to understand when a broker is terminated by Aussie, what happens to the portion of the trail commission that comes from the lender to Aussie what happens to that portion that would otherwise be going to the broker who submitted that loan? If the, um, the trail is, the, the lender has the ability to cease trail payment, certainly on the loans that were fraudulent mm -hmm. um, and on all loans for that particular broker. So they, have, they certainly have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they do not do that, I, I think I understood from your evidence yesterday that the trail commission would be picked up the portion of the trial commission for the broker would be picked up by the broker who takes over the loan. Is that correct? Uh, no. So the way that works is if a broker picks up that the customer and they're the customers in the pending, so between the customer being seen and settlement, um, if the broker looks after the customer and takes them through to settlement, then that new broker would be entitled to the commission involved in taking them through to settlement. I see. But the trail isn't then given to another broker. I see. Um, we, you know, we will take responsibility for the, the, the loans that this, that Ms Khalil in this case had written. We will take responsibility for working with, communicating and looking after her customer base 
It's only the new customers that would go to another broker. So does that mean, Ms Harris, that if the lender doesn't terminate the Trail Commission to Aussie, Aussie in these circumstances retains the entirety of that Trail Commission as it continues to come in. Uh, they don't provide any portion of that to another broker who has taken over looking after that customer. That's right, because yes, the, yes, the, the way that the Commission works, the broker will be will receive financial benefit for the customers that they look after from settlement ongoing. I, I tender this email chain, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.57, AHL, Travel 02, Travel 01, 3317, email from uh, uh, Hal to White, 26 March 14, and associated emails. Now, Aussie revoked the authorisation of Ms Khalil and her company as credit representatives of Aussie Home Loans on the 4th of April 2014. Yes. And on the 10th of April, Aussie notified ASIC that Ms Khalil had ceased to be a credit representative yes. of Aussie. Is that correct? Yes. And that was done by a standard form, a standard ASIC form uh, that provided no information to ASIC about the circumstances that had led to the termination um, of her relationship with Aussie as an authorised credit representative? So that my understanding is that that then triggers ASIC to come back and um, request documents <coughs> to give the background on the situation. W what do you base that understanding on, Ms Harris? On the reports that I've seen from ASIC where we have provided documents that they have requested. Well, let me show you the document you provided to ASIC, AHL 0002 0001 3260. It's a three-page document. If we could start with the first and second pages on the screen. You see that this is a standard ASIC form, I can. Ms Harris? Yes. And uh, what it tells ASIC is that on the 4th of April 2014, a person with a particular credit representative number uh, has ceased to be appointed as a representative by Aussie under their uh, credit licence. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Um, we see Ms Khalil's name uh, uh, as the um, second of three on this form. So this is not a form just about Ms Khalil. It's about... Um, three different individuals or entities ceasing as credit representatives of Aussie. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think so, yes. And the final page of the form is 3262. So you've now seen the entirety of the form and you can see that there's no explanation of any reasons yeah. so for the cessation. Not, yep, you're absolutely right. It was, it was not a formal notification to ASIC about about her, it was simply letting ASIC know that she had ceased to be a credit representative. Is your evidence that ASIC contacted Aussie as a result of receiving this form and asked for information about why Ms Khalil had ceased to be a credit representative? What I believe is that there was a follow-up email about others and ASIC asked for a list of all brokers who had been, the very few brokers in fact, who had been terminated due to adverse circumstances. Yeah, I, I, and that, I want you to think carefully about this, Ms Harris, because okay. there is a letter that I will take you to later from ASIC in connection right. with Mr Sahay. Um, is your evidence, and I'll, I'll tell you there is nothing in your statement about this, right. is your evidence that in response to receiving this form, ASIC contacted Aussie Home Loans and requested further information about Ms Khalil? I, I'm, my apologies. I was thinking that it was a formal ASIC notification. It was simply the notification about the credit rep. So yes. um, I withdraw that. Yes, yes, thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 1.58, AHL, Travel 02, Travel 01, 3260. Uh, what do we call it? Letter. ASIC uh, yes. cessation thank you. form, is it? <coughs> cessation of her being a credit rep. A credit representative, I should say. ASIC cessation of credit representative form, uh, 10 April 14. 
If it assists Commissioner, it, it's a form CL31 under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. I speak of little else, Ms. <laughs> Hall. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Harris, uh, the, the letter that I think you may have been referring to earlier, uh, we don't have. I don't think it was provided by Aussie, but we have Aussie's response to that letter to ASIC, which is AHL 0000012446. And again, if we could have the first and second pages of this document on the screen, that would be helpful. Do you see that this is a letter from Aussie to ASIC on the 13th of October 2014? And then you'll recall that the document we just dealt with, the notification um, of cessation as a credit representative, was in April 2014. So this October letter from Aussie to ASIC records that it is in response to a letter from ASIC dated 23 September requesting further information in relation to steps taken by Aussie following the revocation of Mr Sahay's authorisation under right. the AHL credit licence. Um, now, ASIC put certain questions uh, to Aussie, which Aussie has answered in this letter. Um, the first question required details of any review conducted by AHL and the findings of that review to determine whether any fraudulent documents may have been submitted by Mr Sahay to AHL's panel of lenders other than Suncorp during the relevant period. So do, do you um, understand this letter, uh, Ms Harris, to be part of ASIC's investigation into Mr Sahay, an yes. investigation that was not triggered by any notification um, by Aussie but by Suncorp, I think you thought yes. earlier, yes. So as part of that in investigation, ASIC has sought information from Aussie, uh, and Aussie has answered the particular question I just read out by saying, in the situation of Shiv Sahay, Aussie relied on the detailed investigations conducted by its panel lenders, in particular Suncorp. Once Suncorp revoked Mr Sahay's accreditation, Aussie terminated Mr Sahay and notified all its panel lenders and made it clear that they should review his pipeline and settled loans. It was made clear in discussions with the panel lenders that Aussie was very happy to assist in any way with their investigations and that Aussie would welcome more understanding of any findings. Now, uh, ASIC also asked Aussie at question four for details of all credit representatives of Aussie other than Mr Sahay, whose authorisation to act has been revoked since 1 August 2013 to the date of this letter, as a result of the credit representative being suspected of giving loan applications to a credit provider which contained false documents. And Aussie told ASIC that since 1 August 2013, uh, so uh, a period of uh, less than a year, it had revoked the authorisation of eight credit representatives due to suspicions of loan applications submitted with false documents. And do we see there that Ms Khalil is listed as one of those eights? We do. Uh, and Ms Khalil is also listed in the table that follows question five about uh, credit representatives who've had their accreditation cancelled by a credit provider. Yes. Uh, now, is this the correspondence that you had in mind when yes, you was. answered my questions yes. before? Yes. I tender this letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.59, AHL 0002 001 2446, Aussie to ASIC, dated 13 10 2014. Uh, Aussie didn't uh, report Ms Khalil's conduct to the police? No, he didn't, no. But ultimately, Ms Khalil was charged with criminal offences? Yes, she was. She was convicted of eight counts of fraud, is that right? Yes, she was. And uh, you deal with that at paragraph 100 of your statement. I do, that's right. Uh, and again, following the identification of this misconduct, Aussie didn't write to any of Ms Khalil's customers uh, to tell her what Ms Khalil had been doing? 
No, we didn't because the customers at that stage were in, obviously were in a settled loan, assuming that that loan was provided to them. Um, and it would be up to the lender to look at whether there are any issues around arrears that would be suggesting that the customer was not able to afford their loan. So, uh, uh, do I understand the answer to that question to be no? Or Aussie didn't write to any of... <coughs> to the <coughs> best of my knowledge, no. Uh, and you say in your statement that Aussie took steps to arrange for Ms Khalil's customers to be assisted by alternative Aussie brokers. Yes, so the pending customers would have been? Yes. yes. And what were they told about Ms Khalil's circumstances, those customers who were dealing with an alternative Aussie broker? They would have been told that her contract had been terminated. And nothing about the circumstances that led to the termination of her contract? Yeah, been told verbally, something to do with that. I can't guarantee I wasn't there when they were, <coughs> when they were, had the conversations with the, the MBL mobile business leader or the state manager? They were told, uh, were they, that her contract had been terminated? Not yes. just that they, they weren't just told that she'd left? No, they would have been told that the contract was terminated. The Hay was, uh, clients were told simply, oh, he's left. I understand that. Yeah, that what was the difference with Miss Hartlil's circumstance that uh, it was thought appropriate to tell her clients that she'd been terminated, but not appropriate to tell Mr Sahay's clients that he'd been terminated. So I think it's, it's, we're talking about a period of time here, and we're talking about um, Aussie getting more understanding and experience, unfortunately, in having to manage these situations, and therefore having a high level of confidence about the words that they could use. You said to me that uh, the clients of Halil would have been told that she had been terminated. Is that something you know or something you surmise? That is what I would hope happened. I, yep, hope. Because it's forensically convenient to you sitting in the witness box to take the answer uh, that I had earlier suggested to you. Is that right, Ms Harris? Um, yes. I, let me just say that is what... If anyone had a conversation, have a com has a conversation with me in these situations, the advice I give them is to say that the contract was terminated. So it's not just that I'm I'm saying the thing here. It is what I firmly believe. It is what I practice continually. Yes. Well, I've interrupted you, Ms. Ormata. Go back to Exhibit 1.59, which is the letter Aussie to ASIC AHL 0002 0001 2446. The second page of that document, Ms Harris, do you have that in front of you? I do. Question four lists eight who have, uh, uh, whose uh, authorisation as credit representative uh, has been cancelled, is that right? That's right. Uh, five uh, talks of credit representatives who have had their accreditation cancelled by a credit provider, is that right? That's right. Why is there a difference between the two lists? Why are there two only whose, credit, uh, whose accreditation has been cancelled by a credit provider, but there are eight uh, who have been cancelled as a credit, credit representative? So when I look at the names in the list, um, so the point five does relate to us receiving notification from a lender um, that their accreditation will be cancelled. If I look at the other list, they were not, we did not receive those notifications from the lenders, but we had enough concerns about the practices of those brokers um, to determine that we needed to terminate their contract. Uh, now that's my assumption of reading the letter, sir. Yes. Uh, you will recall I asked you a series of questions earlier this morning about uh, what I should understand from your evidence. In particular, one of those questions was whether at this time uh, it was Aussie's view that it was for the lender to investigate and determine the question of fraud. Do you recall me asking you that question? I do, in, in terms of defining fraud or not, yes. Yeah. 
Well, am I to infer from this letter, in particular the differences between paragraphs four and five, that there were cases where Aussie, without waiting for a lender, decided that it had enough concerns to warrant terminating the engagement of a broker as a credit representative. Yes. So Aussie was in a position, in at least those cases, from within its own resources to arrive at a conclusion that the appointment as credit representative should be terminated. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Um, if Thank you. Some of these don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily be defined as fraud is my point, but it is still behaviour that we believe is not appropriate for the business. Um, and therefore their, their agreements were terminated. Yes. Well, just to be clear about that, Ms <coughs> Harris, um, both of these tables relate to people suspected of giving loan applications to a credit provider which contained false statements. Do you see that? Um, I can. So if I look at the first on that list, um, that was a situation where the broker told the customer that the loan was approved before the loan actually was approved. So... But where was the false document in connection with that? I don't... I don't... I'm not really, really familiar with that one. But what I can say is that there may not have been a false document. There may have been false um, misleading and false information given to the customers. Just before you, just before you conclude your answer, just for your own safety, go back and look carefully at what is said in paragraph 4 Think about the question you've just been asked. Needs be will have it repeated, then okay. answer it. Okay, but read so I can... paragraph four before you go on. All right, so I know in paragraph four we talk about contained false documents. So uh, what I don't know is whether misleading information is also considered false in that case. I don't know, I didn't write the letter. Well, whoever but wrote the letter took the view that the eight people in the first table were suspected of giving loan applications to a credit provider which contained false documents. Do you agree with that? That's exactly what the letter says, yes. Thank you. Uh, could I uh, just come back to the topic that uh, we start, that the Commissioner started with then, which was what was said to customers about uh, whether Mr. I'm sorry, whether Ms. Khalil had been terminated or had left. You deal yes. with this in paragraph 79 of your statement under the heading correspondence with customers regarding Ms. Khalil. And what you told the commission in your statement is that where a home loan application was pending, AHL reallocated Ms. Khalil's customers to another Aussie broker. Those Aussie brokers were directed to contact Ms. Khalil's former customers to offer to revisit and, if appropriate or necessary, resubmit their home loan application. Those steps were taken as soon as practicable after AHL became aware of the misconduct. Those are the only steps taken that you referred to in terms of the correspondence with customers regarding Ms Khalil. Uh, you didn't say anything in your statement about those new brokers being told to explain to the customer that Ms Khalil had been terminated. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. That's what's said in that paragraph, yes. Thank you. Um, can we uh, move Ms Harris to the third of the brokers that you deal with in your witness statement? Uh, a person by the name of Madvan Nair. That's right. M Mr or Ms? Um, Mr. Sorry. Mr Madvan Nair. Now, he was a franchisee broker, is that right? Yes, so he worked in a store, yes. Sorry, he, he was originally sorry, he was store. Sorry, sorry to get you off. He was originally a mobile broker and then he moved into working out of a store. So sorry. that distinguishes him from the first two brokers, is that right? That's right. Yes. Uh, and Aussie first became aware of his misconduct on the 24th of June 2014. Yes. And how did Aussie become aware of his misconduct? 
So ANZ notified us of concerns, so again it was the lender notifying us. Could I take you to AHL 0001 0001 Do you see there, uh, that if we could have the second page of that email on the screen as well, that would assist. An email from Ms Brown. Ms Brown was from ANZ. That's right. Uh, to Matthew White concerning Mad Van Nair. And under the heading Case Background, we have detected five applications with an employer owned by the same entities and all five have pay slips in identical form with the same yearly income of 75,000 for each applicant. You see that? Yes, I do. Uh, and ANZ explains to Aussie in this email a bit about investigations that it has conducted to date. Uh, I did in relation to those pay slips. I won't go through that in detail, but I want to put to you, Ms Harris, that the anomalies with the pay slips, much like the anomalies with the letters of employment for Ms Khalil, were easily detectable. Yes, I... You accept that? I do. But they were not detected by Aussie? No, they weren't. Yes. They weren't. We've moved on a little in time. We're still in 2014, but systems had still not been improved to permit detection of this sort of conduct. Systems hadn't been improved sufficiently to detect, you're right. Uh, now, there's another email in that chain on the first page, uh, 3135. This is Joanne Gilby receiving an email from Matthew White. And uh, Matthew White tells Ms Gilby that Mr Nair has submitted 15 applications to ANZ over the last six months. Five have been reviewed and there have been similarities identified in the pay slips of the applicants. Same employer, same pay slip format, same salary and all have different positions. ANZ Fraud Department have recommended revoking accreditation However, after discussing with ANZ State Manager Wendy Brown this morning, we've agreed on the following steps. Aussie to conduct a review on MADVAN files across a number of lenders to determine whether this is systemic fraud. MADVAN placed on fraud watch at ANZ and all applications to be investigated. On completion of Aussie audit, Matt White to meet with Wendy Brown to go through the findings. Wendy Brown and Matt White to meet with Madvan to conduct formal interview in relation to these files. If Madvan is found to have acted fraudulently or been complicit in any fraudulent activity, then ANZ will re revoke accreditation and he will be terminated from Aussie immediately. If it's determined that Madvan had no knowledge and was not complicit in the fraudulent activity, then he'll be given a warning only. Mm -hmm. Now, as we saw with Ms Khalil, uh, I want to put to you that the action taken by Aussie in response to Mr Nair's conduct was again dependent upon the results of the investigation taken by ANZ and whether or not they made a decision to revoke Mr Nair's accreditation. Yes, that's right. So we, we committed to conduct a review ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, and at the same time of ANZ, and if ANZ withdrew his loan writer accreditation, then that breached his contract with us. Yes. And immediately the agreement was terminated. Thank you. I tender that email chain, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.60, AHL 0001001336, email White to Gilby, 24 June 14, and associated email. I take you to AHL 0001 0001 Ms Harris. Now we might need the this is quite difficult to read. We might yeah. need to uh, magnify, thank you. 
this is the same day as the notification from ANZ, the 24th of June. It's 2.33 in the afternoon now, and Joanne Gilby uh, is sending this email to Matthew White. She's done a high-level look at Madvan's files, and I believe that the below action is justified. I've reviewed recent scanned files in Speedview and have identified the following five files whose letters of employment are very similar and are all signed by the same person regardless of employer. Do you see that, I Ms do. Harris? Yes. Uh, so <coughs> there are 45 files reviewed. I think we're going to need to go down the page to see this. I'm sorry, we're going to need to go to a different document to see this. The high level review on the day of the notification from ANZ is as recorded in this email and the anomalies detected in that high level review are as recorded here by Ms Gilby. That's correct? And I'll, I'll tender that document before moving to the next commission. Exhibit 1.61 AHL 0001-0013110, email Gilby to White, 24 June 14. And I'll ask that you now be shown, Ms Harris, AHL 0001-0013144. This is the following day. We'll again have to zoom in on it so that you can see that this is an email on the 25th of June 2014. Another one from Joanne Gilby to Matt White. So uh, by 1.55 the following day, um, Ms Gilby has identified a total of nine opportunities submitted to Westpac that have questionable letters of employment with two company names involved, uh, no landline number identified or operating address on letters of employment or internet etc that I could identify. All have been signed by a particular individual whose name's redacted as the operations manager. I've only identified one A and Z submission with letters of employment and they are not included in the above. I have reviewed 45 files. Do you see that? I do. Thank you. I tendered that document. Exhibit 1.62 AHL 001-001-3144, email Gilby to White, 25 June 14. <coughs> there were discussions after this with ANZ about steps that should be taken. Yes. Uh, and these involved Aussie reviewing files across a number of lenders to determine whether there was systemic fraud. Do you accept that? Whether there was fraud related to this broker across multiple lenders, yes. Yes. Uh, and these steps were agreed between ANZ and Aussie, is that correct? Um, yes, it seems to be the case, yes. Why, why did Aussie need to agree the steps with ANZ? In all honesty, I don't know. So that's unusual. I was surprised when I read that. You read um, that in, and it might be helpful if we get the document back up on the screen that's already yeah, been tended. But, I, yeah, but no, you, I did. you saw I, that. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It, it was 0001 3135. Yes. Uh, so uh, Matt White and Wendy Brown of ANZ had agreed a strategy for this. What, you say that was unusual. Why? Um, because normally the discussion with the broker, if there are issues, does not necessarily involve the lender directly. There has been discussions with the lenders, obviously, to, as one of the factors before that discussion happens. Um, but in my experience, the discussion is usually with Aussie people. So it would be the state manager, um, it would be perhaps someone from compliance in the discussion. Mm -hmm. my, that's my experience. I, trying to be as helpful as I can here, so. Yes. Well, the day after this, the 25th of June, uh, the same day as the, um, uh, the 44, 45 file review, Mr Nair was suspended by Aussie, is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, well, he was suspended by the franchise entity, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's, that's correct, yes. Uh, and then in, in the following weeks, various lenders started terminating Mr Nair's accreditation with them. That's right. St George did so on the 1st of July 2014. 
You deal with that in paragraph 113 of your statement. Yes. And Westpac followed suit on the 7th of July 2014. Yes, they did. And on that same date, Aussie terminated its agreement with Mr Nair's company. Yes, that's right. Uh, could we have AHL 0001 0001 0032? This is the termination letter uh, sent by Aussie to uh, Mr Nair on the 7th of July 2014. Yes. And if we could have the last page of that document on the screen as well, 0036. You'll see that that termination letter was sent by Matthew White. It was, yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.63 AHL 0001 0001 0032 termination letter 7 uh, July 14 AHL to Nair. <coughs> and on the same day as sending this termination letter, Ms Harris, Aussie sent the prescribed form to ASIC notifying that uh, Mr Nair was no longer, he had ceased to be a credit representative That's of right. Aussie. Yes. And again, that form said nothing uh, about the circumstances of Mr Nair's departure from Aussie. That's right. And Aussie said nothing to ASIC about the circumstances of Mr Nair's departure from Aussie until the letter that we saw earlier on the 13th of October 2014, which was sent in connection with uh, ASIC's investigation of Mr Sahay. That's the document that is AHL 0002 0001 There was no notification to the police of Mr Nair's conduct, Ms Harris? No. But criminal charges were ultimately brought against Mr Nair through the work of ASIC? That's right. And Mr Nair admitted to 18 counts of fraud? He did. And Aussie doesn't know how many of Aussie's customers or loans were affected by Mr Nair's fraudulent conduct? We don't know how many settled customers were affected by it. Well, Aussie is only aware of the ones that ASIC detected in its investigation, is that right? Aussie is only aware of the ones that, that were detected and the ones that we had records of. Mm -hmm. No compensation or remedial steps were taken in connection with this conduct? Um, with Mr Nair, we did pay compensation, I believe, to a customer. Can I just check that? Yes, you deal with this in paragraphs 139 to 141 of your statement. That's right, yes. I see. So there's an ex gratia payment that was made. Is that what you're referring to? Ex payment made to the customer, yes. So there was... A customer who had been affected by the conduct of Mr Nair who complained to Aussie Home Loans, is that right? Uh, that's right, yes. And that customer had engaged a solicitor to act on their behalf? That's right. And why did Aussie pay that customer who complained to Aussie an ex gratia payment? Because there had been a financial loss for that customer um, and while some of the, as, as I understand it, I wasn't part of the investigation but let me, under, let me explain what I understand. Um, as part of the investigation, um, there was recognition that, that Aussie, or in particular Mr Nair, was partially responsible for that and therefore some kind of financial compensation was applicable. He was partially responsible for what? For the situation that the customer was in. What was the situation the customer was in? Um, I'll need to double check my notes. Um, it will be in the notes in here, so um, it's not. You're shaking your I, head. I don't know what you're referring to uh, there, Ms well, you, you If you have a document that explains it, then I'm happy for you to locate it. Right, OK. Is well, that what you're saying, that you have another yeah, document I, I there? Yeah, I believe that there, were, there are details about the particular customer. I'm happy to... 
attempt to locate it just might take me a little bit of time. Well, I, I don't think that's the most efficient way of doing it. Uh, right, okay. Let me ask you this, Ms Harris. What, what is an ex gratia payment? An ex gratia payment is a lump sum payment made in a situation without defining exactly what for, is my definition of it. I can't say what the definition of it was in this particular circumstance. What would you say uh, to my description of an ex gratia payment being a payment to ensure that a person does not take further action, further action against Aussie? That may well be an element of it. I wasn't involved directly with this, but it, it, it certainly can be. It can, it can be a gesture, and it can be a gesture on the basis that um, other aspects are no longer continued with. That's so you say in your statement this person had a lawyer and complained to Aussie, and in response, Aussie made an ex gratia payment. Can we uh, infer from that that the ex gratia payment was made in response to threatened legal proceedings? You can infer from that that there was acknowledgement that the customer had been disadvantaged in some way and we were partially complicit in that. Do you know what the sum of the ex gratia payment was? I think it was thirteen and a half thousand. Thirteen and a half thousand dollars. And you're unable at present to tell the Royal Commission what the circumstances of that customer's complaint yeah, were. Um, I can certainly look for it and, and I'm I'm sure there is a document and I'm happy for um, our barrister to table the document about the details. Well, perhaps your barrister will be able to find that document and ask you some questions about it in re-examination. I'll, I'll move on for now. Yeah, the words uh, that chill everyone along the bar table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll move on to the final broker dealt with in your statement, uh, Ms Harris. Uh, Mr Bernard Meehan. That's right. Now, he was a mobile broker like uh, the first two he was. dealt with in your statement. He was. And Aussie first became aware of fraudulent misconduct by Mr Meehan in 2015, on the 2nd of February 2015. That's right. And this time, it was Aussie who detected the misconduct. Is that right? That's right. And Aussie detected it as a result of a file review, you tell us in your statement. Yes. And. Mr Meehan's files were selected for review in circumstances where Aussie was conducting targeted reviews for brokers who'd submitted over 50% of their loans to a single lender. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and it wasn't just the fact for Mr Meehan that he'd submitted more than 50% to a single lender, it was also the fact that the particular lender that he had submitted them to was Westpac. Is that right? That's right because Aussie had formed the view that uh, the credit assessment processes at Westpac uh, were more lax than at other lenders. Is that right? Aussie had formed the view that the fact that they were just requiring a letter of employment as opposed to pay slips would be something that, um, that brokers would become aware of. Brokers would be? Become aware of, that they had a policy where it was going to be easier to provide the, the documentation that was necessary. And do you mean by that a letter of employment is an easier document to falsify, to prove income, than other sorts of yes. income documents? Yes. And therefore there was a greater risk of fraud in connection with applications submitted to Westpac? If a, if a broker is putting a substantial majority of their loans to the one lender, it was, it was a trigger for us to need to investigate more um, to understand why that is. It's not always. There are situations where the broker is doing that for good reason, but it is, it is a trigger for us to start looking. That's another area that we're going to build into the broker dashboard. So percentage of, percentage of loans going to one lender Yes. So that that's a trigger for us to look understand. Further. But here, as I understand it, the extra trigger was the, the, the identity of the lender. Is that right? Do you accept that? What I accept is that the product features at the time with that lender meant that if someone was wanting to do the wrong thing and, you know, <laughs> We have, we have over a thousand brokers and the vast, vast, vast majority of people want to do the right thing by the customer. So we are talking about a few here and I think that's important to acknowledge. 
Yes, I'll just read from your statement, though, to be clear about this at 1.43. The file review of Mr Meehan was prompted by AHL's observation that Mr Meehan had submitted over 50 per cent of customer home, applica home loan applications to Westpac in the context of AHL's knowledge that Westpac's credit assessment processes accepted letters of employment to be used for income verification. Mm -hmm. That's correct? That's correct, yes. And, and do you accept that, I think you already have, that that's because a letter of employment is a document uh, that's easier to falsify than other income documents. That seems to be the case. Yes, yes. I'm thank not, you. I haven't, I haven't tried to do that myself, but it would seem to be logical. Well, does Aussie have processes in place to deal with the risks of fraud associated with home loan applications where the proof of income is a letter of employment? My understanding is that all lenders now ask for more of that, more verification than that. We certainly, when we are training our brokers, we certainly ask them to obtain as much documentation as they can, including pay slips, and for them to, where possible, check that the money on the pay slip, so the indication of what the customer is being paid is actually seen again in the bank statements as a, as a verification process. So having detected this on the 2nd of February 2015, there was a preliminary report created within Aussie on the 10th of February 2015, is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, and that document is AHL 0005 0001 1654. You're familiar with this document, Ms Harris? Yes. And could I ask that the second and third pages of the document be displayed on the screen? And we see there that the purpose of this document is to provide key stakeholders with a background into matters involving Mr Bernie Meehan. <coughs> There are a number of identified issues involving Bernie that need to be addressed in detail before a decision is made as to what formative action, if any, should be taken. And under the background section, there's a reference to the detection on 2 February 2015. Uh, and you see the second paragraph down, Bernie Meehan was identified as submitting a large volume of loans with Westpac. Issues have been recorded previously in regards to Westpac submissions, particularly around the use of false pay slips, so further investigation was warranted. And as part of Joanne's review, a number of Bernie's files submitted to Westpac contained a series of pay slips that were in fact not only in the same format, but also in the same font and style. In addition, all the pay slips in question contain an annual salary, however the majority lack leave entitlements, and in one case the ABN listed does not even exist. Yep. This could be a legitimate error, however based on the overall number of pay slips recorded as being similar in style, it certainly raises concerns of potential fraudulent activity. <clears throat> Furthermore, the salary amounts are in fact in the vast majority of cases actually similar, whole dollar figures and when further investigation was made into bank statements and supporting documentation, the salary deposits could not be found. There is no relevant information to support these salaries and the subsequent regular deposits. Uh, and we see from page, the page on the right hand side of the screen, Westpac are not aware of the behaviour. Do you see that under the table? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I it do. is noted that as part of the actions that they be notified, as they will be able to assist us in the investigation process, ensuring that all of the information supplied to them has been reviewed and that the appropriate decisions have been made. And the conclusion is, based on the information at hand, it would appear that Bernie Meehan could be engaging in practices that are contrary to the requirements outlined in his franchisee agreement and contrary to the provisions of the NCCP. One or a combination of these matters, if proven, could potentially bring the Aussie Home, Lands brand into, Aussie Home Loans brand into disrepute. The concern is that there are some 22 files containing pay slips with no supporting documentation to assist in proving that the salaries are legitimate, let alone if the client is in fact employed by the said employer. 
I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.64, AHL 0005, 0001, 1654. Uh, document entitled Matter of Bernie Meehan, Overview, 10 February 15. A further report was <coughs> created on the 20th of February 2015. You tell us in paragraph 150, 151 of your statement. I'll show you that document. It's AHL 0005 0001 1954. You recognise this document, Ms Harris? Um, yes, it's an incident report, yes. And could I ask that the second and third pages of the document be displayed on the screen? And I'd like to direct your attention to number three on that pa page, controls that did not work or were not in place. Do you see that the document records nil controls failed Broker has submitted pay slips that appear to be fraudulent on a number of occasions. Mm. I want to suggest to you, Ms Harris, that that means that there has been a failure in controls, not that nil controls have failed. I agree. Yes. So you don't know why the document records nil controls failed? I don't know. In circumstances where this broker has managed to engage in fraud on multiple occasions before detection by Aussie? No, I don't. I don't know why that has been written like that. And under that, uh, number four, impact. Describe and or quantify the potential or actual impact. Financial nil at this stage. Reputation slash customer. Potential for impact to brand reputation, depending on exposure. Regulatory potential breaches of the NCCP. That's the National Credit Act. Mm -hmm. And could I also direct your attention to item seven on the following page. Preventative action. Yes. Preventative action description. This is to address the cause. Yes. Continue to proactively monitor files of Aussie brokers across the board to ensure that a high level of compliance is maintained focus on brokers where there are high submission rates with particular lenders, particularly Westpac, due to their policy that they do not require pay slips in the majority of cases. This is not an isolated incident within Aussie and requires continued monitoring. Yes. What do you know about steps that were taken as a result of the identification of this issue as not an isolated issue within Aussie? Um, so there was, although it took several months to instigate, there was a review done that primarily focused on lender concentration. What were the results of that review? The results were um, that all brokers where they had a large amount of percentage um, were looked at, so the, the loan applications looked at. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone else that was actually found to be fraudulent as a result of that mm -hmm. review. And having recognised that there were brokers yeah. with high lender concentration and having decided that there was no fraud in connection with those, what steps, if any, did Aussie take to deal with the high lender concentration for those brokers? When there's a high lender concentration, as was in identified in that case, then that information is provided to the mobile business leader, assuming it's the mobile channel, or the retail business consultant, um, and they have conversations with the broker to verify why the broker is putting most of or the majority of their loan applications with one lender. And the advice that we give in that situation, having had a conversation with an MBL two weeks ago about exactly this, the advice they give is, you know, what it does is starts to make us question that they're putting the loan with the best lender for that customer. So they, you know, the broker really needs to be able to demonstrate that that particular product was particular for that customer or they're not doing their investigations properly, they're not looking at requirements and objective properly. I tender the incident report, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.65, AHL 0005, 001, 1954, AHL incident report, 20 February 2015. 
Mr Meehan was suspended on the 25th of February 2015, Ms Harris. He was. And he was terminated as an authorised credit representative of Aussie, as was his company, on the 3rd of March 2015. Yes, he was. Uh, and his agreement with Aussie was terminated on the 6th of March 2015. Yes. And on the 16th of March, Aussie lodged the standard form with ASIC notifying that Mr Meehan and his company had ceased to be credit representatives of Aussie. Yes. And at some point in March 2005, which you don't specify in your statement, Aussie notified panel lenders of Mr Meehan's termination under adverse circumstances and yes. asked them to review all loan applications pending settlement, as well as settled loans. Uh, and to take any necessary action. That's right, yes. And on the 10th of April 2015, we see the first notification across these four brokers by Aussie to ASIC. Is that right? That's right. And the notification to ASIC was that Mr Meehan had been terminated under adverse circumstances. Is that right? That's, that's right, yes. And you explain that in paragraph 163 of your statement. Precisely what was said to ASIC about those adverse circumstances? I can't tell you that. I wasn't party to the conversation. Uh, do you have any document recording that notification to ASIC? We have, we have information. We certainly have information that we provided to ASIC when they issued a notice requiring the production of books. I'm sorry, when they issued when, a when notice? When ASIC issued a notice requiring production of books to AHL. I see. That, that comes, as I understand your statement, that step taken by ASIC comes after you have notified them of the termination under adverse circumstances. Is that That's right? right? Yes. So I infer from your statement that as a result of that notification, ASIC commences an investigation into That's Mr Meehan. And as part of that investigation, a notice was issued to Aussie requiring books to be provided to ASIC. That's what I understand, yes. Uh, and on the same date that Aussie made this notification to ASIC of adverse circumstances, Aussie also, for the first time in the four cases that we've looked at, notified the MFAA that yes. Mr Meehan had been terminated in adverse circumstances. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Uh, and I'll show you AHL 0005 0001 1816. Is this the notification by Aussie to the MFAA on the 10th of April 2015, Ms Harris? What I understand it to be, yes. And the MFA, MFAA was notified that Mr Meehan had been terminated by AHL in circumstances that AHL consider adverse. That in circumstances that consider adverse, yes. Um, yes. Is that the entirety of the information that was given to the MFAA about the circumstances of Mr Meehan's termination? So that will trigger a discussion um, because in the lender market, adverse, adverse is a word used for misconduct. What, why doesn't Aussie use the word misconduct? <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell you that. I'm, and I'm not, that's not, <laughs> I honestly don't know the answer to that. And I do you think know it would be a, some kind of legal thing, but I don't know that. I don't know why. Do you know what the result of this notification to the MFAA was? It was to revoke his membership. Thank you. Uh, I tender that letter, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.66, AHL 0005-001-1816, letter Aussie to MFAA, 10 April 15. Aussie still didn't notify the police about Mr Meehan's conduct, is that right? Across all four of these brokers, there was never a notification by Aussie of the conduct to the police. That's right, yes. Uh, and as part of ASIC's investigation, uh, ASIC ultimately formed the view that Mr Meehan had submitted payslips 
document checklists and loan serviceability forms in nine home loan applications to Westpac over a 12 month period in 2014 to 2015, which were false or materially misleading. Yes. And again, Aussie doesn't know how many loans have been affected by the misconduct other than the nine home loans um, to Westpac identified by ASIC. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And did Aussie communicate with any of the customers in the nine files identified by ASIC? Um, each of the customers would have been reallocated to a broker. Mm. If I didn't say that in these notes, my apologies. And what, if anything, were those customers told about Mr Meehan? They would, have told, they would have been told. I would like to think they were told that his contract was terminated. What I can guarantee to the court is that they were obviously told that he had left. I don't know what they were physically told. My apologies. All right. Uh, those are the questions I want to ask you about the individual brokers referred to in your statement. Uh, but there are some uh, other documents in connection to those brokers that I'd like you to identify for the court. Uh, the first is Aussie's contract with Mr Nair, dated the 3rd of September 2008, which is AHL 0001 0001 Uh, now, is this a copy of Aussie's independent contractor agreement uh, with Mr Nair? I appreciate it's difficult for you to answer that without seeing another page, so I'll try and find for you the page that is signed by Mr Nair. Mm, that's at the end of the agreement. Yes, thank you. Uh, we go to the last page. I think it's 4523. You see this is uh, the contract, the independent contractor agreement with Mr Nair? I do, yes. And could I just direct your attention to a small number of provisions within the contract. The first is on 4527. So on 4527 we see how the upfront commission uh, is calculated for Mr Nair and it might assist if we have 4526 and 4527 on the screen at the same time. So upfront commission payments on new settled loans, do you see that at the bottom of page three? Yes, I do. You are entitled to be paid on each monthly payment date a commission, upfront commission, in respect of each settled loan calculated in accordance with the table in clause 1.2. That's right. And 1.2 tells us that Aussie will determine a pass-through rate based on IMSV for the previous calendar month in accordance with the following table. And IMSV we see from uh, 4525, so it's the preceding page, in month settlement value. Do you see at the bottom of page two? Yes, in I do. month settlement value or IMSV means the settled loan amount of each settled loan in respect of a given calendar month according to records provided by panel lenders and or strategic partners. That's right. Yes. So if we could go back to the table on page 4527 pass-through rate based on the IMSV for the previous calendar month in accordance with the following table. And the pass-through rate uh, is between 20 and 55 per cent, depending on the value of the IMSV. Is that right? Right, yes. Now, uh, 
There is also on the same page, if we could pan back out, a reference to a performance-based upfront commission uh, on new settled loans, clause two. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And what do you understand about the circumstances in which the performance-based upfront commission payments are made? Would I ask for that to be expanded, that section? Yes, of course. Uh, so, clause two. If I can, I'll just read it. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, could you ask the question again then? I, I was just hoping you could explain to the Commission how this performance-based upfront commission works. This is separate to the other commission that we were just looking at that was calculated applying the formula that I referred to? Yeah, so my understanding is the performance commission is where we receive a higher rate from the lender. When we received, it should be, past tense. So the commission paid to Aussie Home Loans is higher? Um, there are, back then, it was more around volume. Now it's about quality of the deals and it is possible that the lender will determine to pay a higher amount. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a higher amount, then that, that flows down. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's connected to the volumes of loans coming from Aussie home loans through to the lender. Is that right? My understanding back then is that that's what it related to, okay. yes. All right. And one other page I want to show you in this document, Ms Harris, which is page 10, 4533. We see from clause 9 that commission was also payable on the cross-sale of products. That's right. And what products were Aussie brokers cross-selling? Um, at that time, there would have been an insurance product. Um, there would have been mortgage protection insurance, so they would have they would have had access to products related to the customer and the home loan. And they still do, do they not? Yes, they still Aussie do. brokers still cross sell a variety of insurance products in connection yes, we do. with the we home still loan have application. Mortgage protection insurance, general insurance, yes. And Aussie brokers continue to be remunerated for the addition, the add-on uh, to the home loan of the sale of one of these products. Yes, they do. And whose products are they? Um, it will vary depending on who the product is. So, you know, um, Allianz provides the insurance, for example. So each of them, ALI, provide the mortgage protection insurance. And so, so there the, are a variety. So the cross-sale payment comes from those entities, is that yes. right? Okay. And also on this page, clause 10, we see the minimum performance requirement that Aussie imposes on the broker. Yes. You must introduce at least six new settled loans each calendar month or such other amount of settled loans as may be advised to you from time to time by Aussie in its absolute discretion. That's right. And does that sort of requirement remain in place in Aussie's contracts with its brokers? It, remi it remains in place. Um, yes, it remains in place. I, I tender the NAIR contract, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.67, AHL 0001 0001, contract between AHL and NAIR of 3 September 08. I want to show you the contracts for Ms Khalil and Mr Sahay. I'm not going to go to them in detail, but do you accept that they contain provisions of the same nature yes. in, in, as, they, as uh, Mr Nair's contract? Uh, Ms Khalil's contract is AHL 0002 0013285. I think it's the next, that's just the Yes. Uh, the contract starts at 3286. Yep. And you'll see Ms Khalil's signature at 3314. So we see Ms Khalil entered into a contractual arrangement with Aussie in August 2007, the 6th of August 2007. Yes. Some years prior to the detection 
uh, of her misconduct. And could I just take you to one additional clause? I'll show you in this one at 3297. Clause 15.3. <clears throat> in the event that if we could have 15.1 still displayed at the same time, that would be useful. In the event this agreement is terminated pursuant to clause 15.1, so 15.1 we see above is the right of termination for all of the reasons there listed. Mm -hmm. In the event this agreement is terminated pursuant to clause 15.1, we will notify all panel lenders and the MFAA or other appropriate professional organisations of the circumstances of the termination. You, the Aussie Mortgage Advisor, and any associate respectively agree not to make any claim against Aussie in respect of such notification. Mm -hmm. But no such notification was made to MFAA. We've established that in relation to Ms Khalil. That's right. I tender that contract, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.68A, HL 0002 0013285, contract AHL and Khalil, 27 June 07. Now, I don't need to take you to Mr Sahay's contract, Ms Harris, because I tendered that yesterday when we were establishing how long Mr Sahay had been a broker with Aussie Home Loans. Uh, now, before we leave the topic of these four brokers, uh, I want to draw your attention to Aussie's response to a letter from the Commissioner asking it to... Uh, um, identify misconduct engaged in over the last 10 years. That response came as part of a um, response from CBA. And you may or may not have seen it. I'll put it on the screen so you can have a look at it. Uh, if we could have on one side of the screen RCD 0001, 0003, 0004 to show you the title page. And then I'll, on the other side, have 0001, 0003, 0034. Have you seen this document before, Ms Harris? No. Uh, could I have 0034 and 0035 now on the screen? These paragraphs, paragraphs 170 to 177, were the response of Aussie Home Loans to the Commissioner's question about the identification of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations over the last 10 year period. Mm -hmm. It appears you weren't involved in... I wasn't involved in this document itself. Mm. There's no mention here of any of the four brokers that we've discussed. Right. The, the thing that I was, I did have visibility over mm -hmm. um, was a list that we compiled, which actually had those brokers included in the list, um, and the heading of that list was misconduct. I think you might be referring to a spreadsheet that was provided by CBA uh, as part of a second response to the commissioner's right. letter. Was I? Okay, yes. so uh, that, that was and, what and I was directly involved in. that there in. is a reference to conduct that was attributable to those four brokers. I don't think they are named, but conduct attributable to those four brokers is in the spreadsheet. Is that I believe, correct? I believe that to be the case. So the spreadsheet I saw actually had their names on it. I, have, I didn't see it after that. Uh, <coughs> can I ask you to look at 175 in particular? Where appropriate, Aussie has reported the conduct issues to ASIC and through group investigations to the police. Do you accept that it was appropriate in all four instances that you've given evidence about for Aussie to report those issues to ASIC and through to the police? Um, it, it should have been considered, absolutely. Well, do yes. you agree with me that it was appropriate that that occur in each of these four instances? Personally, yes. And do you agree, therefore, that this statement in this document is, is not accurate because Aussie did not report critical conduct issues that are covered by your evidence to ASIC or to the police? So if, the, if this 
sentence is just talking about the four brokers, um, then we didn't. Um, we have recently notified the police about a broker that we terminated, mm -hmm. um, and so it may have been referring to that as well. Mm -hmm. And do you see that the second sentence here is in addition as Aussie requires all Aussie brokers to be a member of the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia, the MFAA, Aussie has reported conduct issues to that body. Now, it is true that Aussie has reported conduct issues to that body. We see that the fourth broker, the conduct issues were reported, but you've accepted, have you not, that conduct issues of the first three were not reported to the MFAA and ought to not have been? Not by Aussie? No, you're right. Thank you. Uh, I have already tendered this document, Commissioner. Could I take you to some documents which are compliance certificates that Aussie Home Loans has to lodge on an annual basis as an Australian credit licensee. Right. Uh, Ms Harris, could I take you to the first, which is Exhibit uh, LH1, to your statement. LH1. Oh, sorry. Sorry. LH1. Well, I, my, the documents that I have referred you to so far in your evidence um, were not annexed to your statement. I'm, I'm now taking you for the first time to a document that is annexed to your statement, right. a series of documents behind your tab one, yes. um, which are annual compliance certificates that Aussie submits to ASIC. And you have provided us with uh, the compliance certificate that covered the period of 12 months uh, from 14 March 2013 and one that covered the period of 12 months from 9 April 2014. Both of those are behind your uh, tab one, exhibit LH1. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Would I ask that the first one just be brought up onto the screen as well, AHL 0008 And could I also have on the other side of the screen 0361? Can you see from the first and last page of this document that it's Aussie's annual compliance certificate to ASIC, signed on the 14th of April 2014? Yes, I see that. And could I ask that you look at 0357 within that document? Is it on the, on yeah, the I think, screen it, that I I think it's coming okay. now. This is the part of the document where Aussie has to certify as to its ongoing compliance with licence obligations. You see that? Are you familiar with this style of document, Ms Harris? I assume that you are, given that you've annexed these to your witness statement. I am superficially familiar, yes. And can you see that by this document, Aussie certified to ASIC that in the 12 months from 14 March 2013, it had adequate arrangement and systems in place to ensure that it did all things necessary to ensure that the credit activities authorised by its licence were engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly? Yes. Uh, that it had adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that it complied with the conditions of its licence? Yes. That it had adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that it complied with the credit legislation? Yes. And to ensure that its representatives complied with the credit legislation? Yes. And on the uh, following page, 0358, uh, that it had a written plan that documented arrangements and systems for compliance with each of its general conduct obligations. Yes. And finally, that it had adequate risk management systems. Yes. So by this document, Aussie certified 
to ASIC that it had complied with all of these statutory obligations, yet this was the year that Mr Sahay and Ms Khalil's fraudulent conduct was discovered and it became apparent that there were inadequate risk management systems and that Aussie's representatives were not complying with the credit legislation and that Aussie had not done all things necessary to ensure that the credit activities authorised by its licence were engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Do you agree? I agree that the controls necessary to pick up those two examples, considering the vast number of brokers we deal with, did not pick up that behaviour. Do you agree that these parts of this document that I have directed you to ought to have been answered no. We do not have adequate systems in place to deal with risk management and the other matters that I've taken you to. What I'm saying is in hindsight, we could have had more robust risk management frameworks or more robust <laughs> compliance testing, and that's what we're building now. So do you maintain that these were the correct answers in this document? I'm not in a position to say yes or no, because at the time, perhaps it was viable. I don't know, I didn't, I, I'm not responsible for filling in the form, so I don't know how those clauses need to be interpreted. Can I take you to another document, uh, Ms Harris, which is CBA 0506 0002 0001. This is a document dated 11 February 2016, entitled Findings from Risk Culture Workshops. Right, yes, I'm just, I mean, I'm familiar with them. You're familiar with this up. document? Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to come up. So this is a document that postdates the conduct that we have been speaking of for the four brokers, because it's from the 11th of February, 2016. Yes. yes. When the document is found, it would be useful. Uh, I'll repeat the number CBA 0506 0002 0001, and it would be useful to have the first and second pages of the document on the screen. Not in the system. Do we have a copy of it? We got a clean copy. Hmm. We've encountered a difficulty, Commissioner, in that the system. The first in three and a half yes. days. I think. <laughs> this is the. I don't think I should be sitting here stamping my foot and going blue in the face because we've encountered a difficulty at this point. Should I? I hope Maybe not. Maybe I should. I hope not. Uh, could I suggest, Commissioner, that as this is the last document that I want to take uh, Ms. Harris to, and uh, as there are matters that I understand I need to discuss with. Aussie's barrister before I complete my questions, um, that we have a brief adjournment to allow me to have need, that. Ms. Orr? I, I don't. You know. want five minutes? I mean, a barrister's five minutes is a very malleable uh, <laughs> concept. Uh, I think it would be useful, given that we have the two matters to deal with, Commissioner, if we had ten minutes. <laughs> I'll come back at. Uh, I have eight minutes past. 12. I'll come back at 20 past 12. Thank you, Commissioner.
risk across Line 1 are not clear, not all staff are aware of their obligations, while others are not aware of the tools available to manage risk. Only 15 per cent of staff agreed that risk tools and systems allow them to easily manage risk. As risk activities are absorbed into business as usual time, staff feel that the management of risk is hidden and not a priority in everything they do. Ownership of risk by Line 1 is not an everyday activity. In order to meet risk obligations, staff rely on the Line 2 team to take accountability for risk activities, though there is not adequate resourcing in the central risk team to sustain these obligations. Yes. And can I take you to 5.3.1? Less than 40% of staff felt they had a strong understanding of risk management or received the appropriate training to manage the risk. Further down in that paragraph, further confusion exists where there is no guidance on which CBA policies are required to be met and how they should be applied to AHL. 5.4.1. We heard that AHL culture promotes good news stories with visible communication of sales or operational successes and not the same visibility for proactive management of risk or lessons learned from mistakes. Over 30% of staff contemplated that raising an issue could be more trouble than it's worth. With the time taken to resolve issues once raised, stopping staff members from speaking up. 5.5.2 on the next page, Ms Harris. The results of the risk culture assessment show a relatively immature <coughs> risk culture, which will impact the implementation of the ORMF. To be successful, AHL needs to create greater ownership of risk by line one through the implementation of the framework. So this document, uh, Ms Harris, was from the 11th of February 2016. What can you say to the Commission about the situation as at today? So if we have context on this, this was part of the um, requirements as CBA increased their shareholding. Yes. Um, so this was a, a new, the, the framework, the concepts was a new framework for us. Yes. Um, and the ratings um, that we were given, we could understand, but we weren't as aware before. So it was an awareness raising thing as well. Um, so if I were to look at the results of the 17 um, risk survey, so you asked me what are we seeing now? If I was to look at the results of the 17 survey, um, there were a number of more positive um, elements. So the results were much higher and actually comparable in many ways with CBA. Um, there was a recognition of greater line one ownership, a recognition, um, an acceptance that it was okay to raise issues, that issues would be addressed. Um, and that was primarily because we'd done workshop with every group to get them to look at their area and start self-assessing their risks. So that was, a, that was certainly a positive. Um, on the areas of requiring still development, um, there were things that we have continued to work on since. Is there an equivalent document from 2017, is there? There was a survey done in 2017, yes. And is there another document that has the findings from, are, are there risk culture workshops again that were conducted it, it was in not, 2017? No, Sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't risk culture workshops, it was a survey that was conducted. In 2017? Yes. Which found, I think you said, that some of this had improved? That's right, yes. And does this document that we've been looking at cover management within Aussie Home Loans? Yes, it does. Yes, so the head office, we're talking about at the most senior levels of Aussie Home Loans that this survey was directed, is that right? The 15 workshops yes. had, every workshop had a cross section of people from different areas within it. Including senior management of Aussie there Home There would have loans. been some senior management involved, yes. So the findings of these risk culture workshops um, in this document dated 11 Fe February 2016 apply to the senior management of Aussie Home Loans at that time? There, could have, there would have been some senior management involved in the workshop. Um, 
And But all the results of the workshop were obviously collated together. Yes, thank you. I tender this document, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.71, uh, what shall I call it? Ms. Orr, risk survey report. Uh, uh, per perhaps findings from risk culture workshops dated 11 February 2016. Thank you. Uh, CBA 0506 0002 001. Those are my questions for Ms. Harris, Commissioner. Now, does any party having leave to appear other than Ms. Hogan Doran seek leave to cross examine Ms. Harris? No application. Very well. Ms. Hogan Doran. I have nothing for Ms. Harris. Thank you. Very well. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, you are excused further attendance.